Hey everyone, this is Alan Schimmel. Welcome to another episode of TechStrong TV for today, Thursday, July 2nd. That's right, July 2nd. Um, this is also episode 60 of TechStrong TV. Glad you can join us. You've probably seen the show by now. Um, or if you haven't seen the whole show, you, you've probably seen episodes or segments of some of our interviews floating around LinkedIn or, or Facebook or Twitter or what have you. But of course, you can watch all of them on our OTT channels on Apple TV, Roku TV, and uh, Amazon Fire, or on our DevOps.com mobile app, our websites, or TechStrong.tv, as well as Digital Anarchists. We have some big news coming up in another week or so on Digital Anarchists, anarchist, so stay tuned for that. Um, but let's talk about today's show here as we, many in the U.S. are ending their week today, with tomorrow people taking off for the July 4th holiday. And I uh, hope you have a good, safe holiday. We'll talk more about that later. But let me, let me give you a quick uh, rundown on what we have in store for today. Our first interview, I, I've invited Andrew Stevenson back. Andrew is the CTO over at Lenses.io, and we had him on a couple weeks ago. But you know I'm fascinated with the whole data ops uh, movement going on within that, the broader DevOps uh, culture. Uh, Lenses.io, I think, is a great example of what, what's happening in data ops. Uh, they're making it people for people who are using like Spark and Kafka and stuff like this uh, to get a better handle on their data. Uh, so I invited Andrew back on because I wanted to really dig in with him use cases, what they're seeing from their customers. How are they using this to not only make their businesses better, but to help, to help us all. So we're going to look at some healthcare organizations and some other Lenses.io customers. Um, on on data ops and how they're using it. After that, you know what? Six degrees of separation. The South Florida technology scene isn't that big a scene, and uh, or it wasn't. It's getting bigger every day. But we about. Eight, ten years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting Roger Barranco. Roger at the time was CTO of a company called HostNet down here. Um, Roger, of course, went on to bigger and better things. I've progressed in my career and in my own personal journey. But Roger, it turns out, is VP of uh, a lot of the data center, a lot of the socks for Akamai. He runs about six or seven socks around the world at Akamai still based here in South Florida. And uh, so I had a chance to catch up with Roger after a few years. It was good to catch up. And he's going to talk to us. Akamai has seen two of the biggest DDoS events that they've ever had. And and just so you know, Akamai carries, I, I want to say it's 30%. It's, it's maybe more even. Of all the traffic on the internet goes through Akamai's network. And so it, it, it's big network. And Roger's going to... Uh, Talk to us about some of these huge, huge doesn't even begin to exp define them, DDoS attacks and how Akamai is responding and how they're also using that to plan for future attacks. So good interview there with Roger. Um, after that, I'm happy to be joined by Pradyut Roy from Manage Engine. I think Pradyut joins us from India. Manage Engine recently, it was part of Zoho, uh, recently did a survey with some interesting results that he's going to share with us. So I, I think you'll enjoy that. I always like to get survey results and see what people are thinking. So we'll, we'll have Pradyut Roy from Manage Engine. And then uh, we'll go into the archives, grab something old. Well, not that old, just from TechStrongCon last month now, a little less than a month ago. And, and for today's session, I have a really good one for you. It's Christina Pinella. And Christina is, uh, of course, with Red Hat. And she's going to talk about digital transformation no longer being an option, what companies can do. And uh, it, as I said, it is from our TechStrongCon conference. If you go to TechStrongCon.com, you can see all of the uh, sessions from TechStrongCon there still. They might be up on Digital Anarchist as well. Um, anyway, after that, I will be back with the news. And then... Um, I've oh, got a surprise for you today. Usually it's Tuesdays, but after TechStrong Con, he had taken a little hiatus, but he's back 
on Thursday this time, though. The one, the only, John Willis, Bacha Galoop, is back. And John has uh, part two of his interview with Dr. Steven Spear uh, out of the MIT labs. Brilliant fellow and, and uh, good interview with John and, and Dr. Spear. Uh, we then have an interview featuring our channel king, Mike Vizard, and he's interviewing the uh, CTO of TIPCO. Nelson Petracek, I might have mispronounced that, I apologize. But Mike is going to be talking to him a little bit about what's going on in TIPCO. Then we have Charlene is going to give us a webinar preview for the rest of the webinars uh, for the week. Then we have the start of a new series here on TechStrong TV. It'll be, I think, every other week. It's from my partner, Jane Grohl, CEO of uh, the DevOps Institute. Association of the Human of DevOps. And Jane is going to do something called Jane Explains. And, uh, you know, if you've ever heard Jane present, she's a good presenter. I think you're going to enjoy Jane Explains. And today's the premiere of Jane Explains. So check that out. Um, and then after that, we have our analyst corner. Sitting in for Mitch in the analyst corner today is uh, ASG principal analyst Sanjeev Sharma who, along with Mitchell, does a lot of the research and analysis over at Accelerated Strategies. And Sanjeev has a great little commentary today I think you'll enjoy. And then we are going to wrap up with a, a real channel uh, happy hour roundup uh, with Mike Vizard and his cohort, Frank Olhurst. And uh, it's good to have the both of them back on. And then I'll be back to wrap things up. So it sounds like quite a show lined up for us today for July 2nd. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with our first guest. With the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important to protect yourself and others from spreading the virus. Prevention and personal safety is key. Here are the top ways you can protect yourself and others. Wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Avoid touching your face. Practice social distancing and avoid high-risk potential people. If you are showing symptoms, stay at home. If you must go out, wear a face mask. Always cover coughs and sneezes with a tissue or use the inside of your elbow. Clean and sanitize frequently touched surfaces daily. Together, we can prevent this pandemic. Okay, our first, our first guest today for July 2nd is Andrew Stevenson, CTO at Lenses.io. If you watch the show regularly, you'll know we had Andrew on about, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, two, three weeks ago. And I was really fascinated, and I am fascinated with the whole data ops uh, story going on within the broader DevOps movement. I do think, you know, we, we have seen data, I mean, data has always been king. We just sometimes forget it. And we've seen, you know, first was the whole big data thing and, and how that revolutionized. And then, of course, getting our arms around big data. And we continue to struggle with analysis and subsets and, and, and what to do in automation with data. And, and so it continues to evolve into what we now see as data ops. I asked Andrew to come on to talk with us a little bit more about Lenses I.O. use cases. But specifically, what, cu what real-world customers and what real-world verticals are using this kind of technology to help, to help us all? And so Andrew has some great examples that he's going to give us. I think it'll help you better understand what data ops is, does, and how it can have an impact. So let's now go to our first interview, Andrew Stevenson, CTO, Lenses.io. This is Digital Anarchist. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this segment for Tech Strong TV. My guest is a, is a repeat guest. I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Andrew Stevenson of Lenses.io. Andrew, was it about two weeks ago you were on the show, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It's great to be back. Yep. Thank you. And thank you for coming back. So, Andrew, let, we, you know, last time we, we, we spoke a lot, but we didn't get to some of the things I wanted to cover with you. So let's jump right into this. Real quick, if you give just refresh people about lenses and your mission. Yeah, sure. So, so data is now a product, and business is starting to recognize that, and business is starting to try to take advantage of real-time data. What they're doing is they're moving to open-source technologies such as 
Kafka in Kubernetes, but it's difficult, it's hard. So Lenses is there to take the complexity and the pain out of it so we can actually get back to focusing on the data. So we have a self-service um, developer workspace. We have our own SQL engine that allows you to practice data ops on top of streaming data. Yep. And, and really, I mean, at some level, and if I'm wrong, correct me, right? The message here is, is that the technology serves the data. The technology has to take the back seat. The data is primal. The data is, you know, you, is, is paramount. And we use the technology to be able to access that data, analyze the data, store the data, but it's about the data, right? It, for too long, you know, we went through this whole big data thing and all of that, and it was all about the technology we use around data, and we, we almost lost sight of the data, right, and, and why we need that. Is, is fair, and, and how we, what are you seeing? I, I think that's completely accurate. If, if I look back on my career, I was actually the most productive and driving the business most when I was actually had a set of tooling around um, the data that was moving, was loading a lot of trading data actually at the time. And by actually being able to get back at looking at the data and giving the people access to the data, for example, the back office, a trade reconciliation system, they were able to actually look at the data and root out the inefficiencies, for example, clearing fees that were wrongly charged. So we're able to save a lot of money. And the, the flip side of that as well is because I was less focused on the technology, I was able to start looking at how I can use that technology to actually go back and drive the business. And I think we sort of lost that in the industry. We, there was an explosion of you said, big data. I think that's exactly right. But that's hard. So Lenses is always then trying to actually take the complexity out of that and use the tech intensity. So tech intensity is out there. The clouds are allowing this now. They're giving us lots of different software, open source, um, all the different components we need to build this, these great data platforms that actually allows us now to go back to the real thing, the real protagonist, data. It's always been about data. It absolutely has been. And, you know, unfortunately, this is in the tech industry where we're, we're kind of guilty of this. We, we will get lost through the trees and not see the forest. We were so excited by what all of that data can show us, give us, allow us to do that we immediately went to what do we need? You know, what house do we need to build to house it in? You know, what, what container, no pun intended, no, what container do we need to, to build this around? What orchestrators do we need? What, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And it became about that, not about the data. But what I'd like if you can share with our audience, Andrew, you know, and this, this is the whole, this modern data ops thing we're talking about. When we could get at the data, Give us, can you give us some concrete examples of what organizations can do when they get at the data that makes the bottom line better, improves the business, makes people's lives better, right? What did, what did, where does that rubber meet the road? Sure. So if we take an example of one of our existing clients, which is Babylon Health, which is a tech startup in the UK, their, their goal is to provide affordable healthcare to everyone on the planet. So... What they're actually interested in is using commoditized technology. So what they're actually able to do now is they're on AWS and they use everything out of the box, the tech intensity. They build a system and are able to, to move it around, for example, into Africa, into the different regions. So what they're actually doing is they're using this, this great technology, it is great technology, Kafka and Kubernetes, for example, to stream in all the medical data and then actually use uh, SQL engines as well to actually power machine learning to provide an AI bot so they can actually deliver the healthcare without people having to, to go miles and miles and miles, especially in Africa, to go and find some, some medical help. So these are some of the real examples of what you see is when you start using the technology, not reinventing the wheel, and actually using that to go back to driving a real business um, value. So even their CEO said in a recent article in the Telegraph in the UK, he said, you know, they want to actually use just that technology so they can make their lives easier for doctors. 
I think certainly at the moment that's uh, really, really powerful. Uh, absolutely. That's a great example. Any, any others maybe? Uh, so what we have as well is a lot of insurance companies, for example, so they're actually using this real-time data with the SQL processing and we're working with them to actually look at insurance fraud, so actually bringing everyone's premiums down. So what they actually want to do is they want to take advantage of the streaming data and use a simple way, such as a SQL engine, to be actually be able to call out to, and also to look up um, data sets in different various uh, ML libraries as well to reduce those premiums so everyone, everyone has an advantage. We have other examples of banks in Sweden, actually. So they're actually utilizing, again, Kafka to get real-time customer 360s. But with Lenses and the SQL engine we have, they're actually able to share that data with third parties. Because I think the key point of this as well is, OK, get access to the data, but you need the governance and the role-based security around it. And we also do that with a data policy we have so that we can obfuscate the data when they're exposing it. So it's the and that, that's important as well, yeah. right? In, in today's compliance, uh, you know, compliance is so important. It, 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 you can't just have kind of wild data running around without, you know, having it boxed yeah. in the right compliance and obfuscated and, and everything else we do to make sure that we're not, you know, giving out yeah. What, what we see is that a, a lot of companies, they recognize the value of real-time data, right? They're not, mm -hmm. you know, there's clever people out there. But what they want to do is they want to be able to utilize that. So, you know, we see a lot of movement to the cloud because they can't find or they can't retain the staff to run it in-house. So th there's, there's a big movement um, towards that. But what they start off with is like, okay, great. So I've got Kafka up. I can monitor Kafka now, was right? So as the maturity grows, they start wanting to onboard tenants onto their platforms. And then the whole question, this is part of where the data ops comes in is, okay, how, how do I securely onboard people into Kafka? How do I provide multi-tenancy on top of these systems? They don't have them. Or well, Apache Pulsar does, but Kafka doesn't by default. And then how do I also provide the governance around that and being able to manage who can see what data and who can deploy what data centric applications is, is a critical part as everyone moves, the maturity grows in these systems. Excellent. Andrew, if you don't mind, I, you know, Lenses has been around a little bit now. You've, you've mentioned a few of your customers. I, I'd like you, if you can, Mm -hmm. to give us sort of the typical, um, you know, there's always a eureka moment, Andrew, with a customer where they say, my goodness, this is a real problem and we need help here. And, you know, God, if we could do this, we could make this happen or we could show people this or we could share that, right? What is what is that road path look like in the in the lenses Right, customer, you know, what, what commonalities in that path do we see in Lenses customers? Uh, so, so the big thing for a lot of people is visibility. We hear quite a lot that people are trying to set up a real-time streaming platform, but the visibility is lacking. You know, we hear lots of comments that it really great to be able to get on board their tenants. Everyone's stuck at the command line. So what we see is as soon as you give the visibility, it opens up people's eyes to what they can and can't do, whether they're a platform engineer, whether they're a data engineer, or whether they may be an analyst who's able to see data that he didn't know was moving before. There's also, I think, an aspect of blindness in terms of applications that are being deployed. So we have another customer, Vortex, so what they do is they track ship movements, so they're trading data for the movement of oil effectively around sort of trying to guess where the ships are going. Um, and as soon as they actually turned lenses on, they were able to see the mess they made actually of their application topology. So there's several moments in there. It's like first, okay, great. I can see my data. I can onboard the tenants now. I can actually remove myself as a bottleneck, especially for the platform teams. They always end up becoming a bottleneck. And once that goes on, then basically you move on to, okay, now I can start deploying 
other tenants, people who want to use the applications, all these people with microservices can now actually get visibility into how they're, how they're deployed, where they're deployed, and how they fit into the bigger, bigger pipelines. This is typically what I see when I, when I speak to customers. It's a, it's a journey of maturity. First, I just want the platform. How do I use the platform? And then they suddenly see the benefits of having the visibility and the governance as well. Got it. Um, now, I, I lost my train there for a second. So, Andrew, you know, I can't help but look at the sweep of of information technology, right? So when I when I was a little boy, my mom was a data processor, right? Which was in those days were punch cards, and you know, and you'd write the time on a mainframe, and. You know, then the the advent of the database, the modern database, and Oracle's primacy, and then of course Microsoft SQL, and the whole sort of modern day, you know, uh, SQL database movement. We went to NoSQL, and then as I mentioned, we went to the big data age with Hadoop and 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 that kind of stuff. And now, today, you know, Kafka is is uh, Apache Spark. These are all. Uh, not household names, but within the within the space, they they they're well known names and technologies. And again, we just didn't. We don't talk enough about what we do with the data, right? So you gave us some examples here of we're getting data to doctors so they could better treat people and and make decisions, life saving, right? Banks with financial stuff yeah. what other give us some other you know why is data king why is why is data primary you know and the technology sort of secondary to it so yeah so so, so data is driving it all they, this is what you want to make your decisions on you want to make your decisions mm -hmm. on customer churn you don't want to make your decisions on whether you're running Kafka versus Pulsar, whether it's running in Kubernetes. In some respects, it doesn't matter. Um, I remember saying to one of the top guys in, in, in a bank in the UK, look how fast I can spin my Hadoop cluster up, how I can add an extra node. He's just not interested in it. What he's actually interested in is the financial reports that come out that are actually not only there for compliance, but also to give also the data ethics, I think, on top of the whole organization. So it, it really, but it's driving everything we do, every decision we make. And it's always will be and always has, has been the, the protagonist. When I was a C++ en engineer, you know, I was still matching and settling trades. So it's always there. It's always a constant. The decisions are always made around that. They're just, the technology just just shifts. Absolutely, and you know, and and it's not just for the you were a C plus plus engineer, a developer. The, the 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 data that we're getting to people with that analysis, it's not just the tech. It's not just for technology people. It's really data. Data runs business. Data runs countries. Data runs our lives or, or not, not runs our lives but data you know has such an influence on what we do in our lives right and 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 so again that's why it's important i'm going to ask you one other really hard question that i haven't been able to get an answer from anyone on and i'm hoping you're going to help people have asked us data ops give me a succinct de definition of what data ops is uh it's <sighs> It's it's building on DevOps to, but also applying governance and giving visibility to the the data that we're um, processing every day. So I see it as a combination of the two. DevOps is very good. You have configuration as code. You make sure everything's monitored. But DevOps is taking it at a, a level up to incorporate the visibility and the governance, so you can drive these. Um, data-driven decisions from it as well. So I think, for me, it is just a combination of the security, the governance, the data ethics, uh, coupled with the best practices of DevOps. 
Excellent. Because that actually was going to, it was a follow-up, was how does it, how does it relate to DevOps? And you, you did it all in one. Andrew, thank you for coming back and, and kind of digging in a little deeper with us. I do appreciate it. I think the audience appreciates it. For people who want to find out more about lenses, where can they go? Yeah, so they can go to lenses.io. They can download a Docker we have very popular with our developers. We also have an online hosted um, image now as well, so you can play around there as well. Fantastic. Andrew Stevenson's from Lenses.io here on TechStrong TV. This is Alan Schimmel. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back with our next guest. DevOps.com is the number one online destination for DevOps education and community building. DevOps.com covers all aspects of DevOps, including DevOps best practices and tools, DevOps culture, DevSecOps, business impact, continuous testing, continuous delivery, and more. DevOps.com has the largest collection of original DevOps content, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.devops.com to learn more. DevOps.com, where the world meets DevOps. Our next interview is an old friend of mine who I had lost touch with, and it was I really enjoyed reconnecting and finding out what he's been up to. Uh, Roger Barranco is a, a VP of, uh, of SOX at, at Akamai. He runs six or seven of the SOX around the world. And, you know, Akamai handles, I think it's more than 30, it might even be more than that, 30% of the internet traffic goes through the Akamai networks. Uh, they've recently, since this COVID thing, seen two of the biggest DDoS attacks they've ever seen. After a while of DDoS sort of dying down, it's, it's reared its ugly head again. And the good news is Akamai was able to deal with it. But Roger's also going to give us some insight into how having these attacks then forces them to plan for future attacks because if these are this big the next ones may be bigger and the size of these attacks are staggering let's go to our conversation with roger barranco of akamai and find out more this is digital anarchist hey everyone thanks for joining us on this segment of tech strong tv you know it's a small world, and there's about six degrees of separation in the technology business. Uh, this next interview was on my calendar, and I, I knew it was someone from Akamai, but I didn't really look, and I knew we were going to be talking about some really big DDoS attacks we've been seeing lately. And I, I get on today, and I find out it's my friend Roger Barranco, who I know... 10 plus years or more here. There aren't that many people in the South Florida technology scene, unfortunately, especially people who have been here a while. And Roger's one of them. He's been CTO of a bunch of companies that I knew, a key person in, in several. And uh, he was at Prolexis when Akamai purchased them. Roger, what was that, about six years ago, seven? That was about seven and a half years ago. Yep, seven years ago. And I we lost touch with each other and and here we are tech strong tv let me introduce you to roger barranco from akamai hey roger welcome hey alan very glad to be here it's a pleasure so roger tell tell the folks what what exactly is your title now and what do you do at akamai i'm the vp of global security operations at akamai so it's my team that responds to cyber attacks to the customers that we're protecting whether that is at layer seven, at the application layer, or more uh, what we're going to focus on today at the routed level for DDoS. Absolutely. And we were talking a little bit off camera. And I mean, your, your, uh, your team is running, what, about six or seven socks worldwide now that, that kind of monitor. And, and, and for those who I think most of our, well, you know what, Roger, about half of our audience are security people, and about half of the audience are DevOps, cloud native folks, and so maybe they're not as familiar with Akamai, but, you know, the number that I always throw out to people that clues them in is, what percentage of traffic on the internet on any given day is running through the Akamai network? Uh, Akamai sees on average around 
30 plus percent of all of all the internet, internet traffic. traffic. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, you know, almost a third of all the traffic on the internet is going over the Akamai network. And, and that's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty, pretty big, big chunk of, of, of worldwide of, of the thing. So when, when Roger's saying he's, he's, uh, you know, with six, seven socks around the, the globe, they need every one of those. He could probably use twice as many if he could. Uh, but Roger, enough Akamai and enough Roger Allen story. I wanted to talk a little bit about this uh, pandemic of DDoS attacks we've been seeing, or epidemic of DDoS attacks we've been seeing around uh, lately, you know, certainly since this COVID situation popped up. Why don't you fill us in a bit? Yeah, Alan, if you don't mind, I'm just going to give a little bit of background to that. So yeah. if we go back a couple years, you know, DDoS back in the Mirai days and the YRX days were super interesting. They were changing every single day. But once Mirai, for the most part, got knocked down, DDoS kind of leveled off. Now, it was still multiple large DDoSs every day, but we weren't seeing those massive spikes in DDoS size for a while. And the duration of those DDoS has really shortened up. So the attack would last anywhere from five minutes, 15 minutes on the outside, and it would trail off. So what we did is working with uh, our customers is we spent a lot of time profiling them and looking at their traffic and putting proactive defensive measures in place so that if an attack comes in, it's already knocked down. The customer doesn't even know that they were attacked. And we send them an attack report letting them know what our analysis was from a security perspective. But it leveled off. And all of a sudden, we started towards the end of last year seeing an increase in the sizes of attacks overall. And at first, we thought we were going to be wrong about one comment that I had made, is that every two years, the largest DDoS seems to double in size. So almost Bronco's law. Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> um, so, you know, if we go back, it was uh, a couple years ago, it was a 600, 700 gig attack. And we were saying, wow, you know, we're going to be up in the terabits in a couple of years. Sure enough, a couple weeks ago, uh, we managed a 1.44 terabit attack. Wow. Now, that's I mean, that's almost one and a half. Yeah, yeah, it's massive, right? And that attack had about 385 million packets per second associated in that. So big on both sides, not only from the attempt to volumetrically overwhelm a pipe, but also the attempt to overwhelm gear from a packet per second. Now, wow. if you look in the, the news, you'll see that AWS reported handling a 2.3 terabit attack this year. So larger from a bit per second rate, but their packet per second rate was under 300. So it was actually smaller in one bucket, but larger in a different one. And then af after that, just uh, a few days ago, we handled an 809 million packet per second attack. Wow. For someone. Yeah. So... By far the biggest we've seen on our platform, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it's the largest that's been reported uh, out in the globe right now from a, a world record perspective. Yeah, but what not I the kind of world really, records you want to set, but... Yeah, exactly. But just to, to jump ahead now, what I find that's different is if you look at the AWS attack, that was one vector. That was just a CLDAP reflection attack, just one vector. The 1.44 terabit attack that my team handled had nine different vectors mixed in. So very different tools able to generate some very large numbers with that. And then the, the 800 million, 809 million packet per second attack, also mammoth, but a different tool. So, hmm. Alan, I'm going to get, I'm going to play your role for a second. Say, Alan, if you were to ask me, you know, what do I think is different here? I don't think the tooling that's grabbing the attacks is all that radically different 
What's very different in these attacks is that many of the IPs were not spoofed. Many of those IPs were the first time that we've seen them. So what that huh. means is that the pace of IoT, Internet of Things being added, it's going like, well, from your perspective, like this, right? Yep. But attacks were not going at that same level. Now, all of a sudden, attacks have caught up to the weaponry that they now have in larger numbers of. Well, it's almost like a surface, if you will. So, a yeah. couple of things here. First of all, I know you can't say who these attacks were aimed at, but my understanding is that one certainly was at a large internet provider and one was at a financial institution. And um, so right away you got to ask yourself, is is the is this financial financially motivated to, to bring on money? Is there some sort of state-sponsored, you know, espionage, sabotage, whatever, right? state-sponsored actions, this type of, of tsunami, if we will, right, is not the kind of thing you'd kitty scripters are going to bring off. The, 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 these kinds of numbers take an awful big organization with a lot of, a lot of coordination. Secondly, you know, we talk about IoT and we talk about never-before-seen IP addresses. To me, are, these are IP6 numbers then, not IP4 numbers? No. IP4. I, IP f that we've never seen before. That we haven't seen involved in an attack. In, in an attack, I mean, yeah. So is it some sort of fresh kind of botnet that's taken over zombies, that's zombieing IoT devices? Or, you know, what, what else could it be? Yes, we did. Track. Uh, this is a huge effort, and it's probably going to take us an over a week to really get into the analysis of what this attack was. But everything that we've seen so far, it's clearly um, IoT. So it's this last attack, the 809 million packet per second one, was not compromised machines. It was not um, reflection attacks or anything like that. It was it was. DVRs, cameras, refrigerators, refrigerators, you know, maybe toasters. Light bulbs, who knows? Yeah, it was stuff. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, out. Roger, I, I, I'll tell you. You know, so I smart housed my house, and I, I recently switched over to a new mesh Wi-Fi, and I, so I was running the reports on IP addresses on the network. And, you know, this is just my house, mind you. You know, I, I had as many IP addresses as, as I think I did in my first hosting company in 1996 <laughs> or 97, right? When the idea of using, like, a C-class was, wow, you know, I got a whole C-class. You know, I, that basically runs my house these days. Um, so it, it, that doesn't surprise me, the amount of devices. What, what I guess I'm wondering is how did they how did they grab control of all that many devices and can we trace back to the you know the point of the, the command control center so at at akamai we don't carry attribution all the way to the individual right mm -hmm. unless um through the customer's permission they ask us to engage uh infraguard or you know somebody like that the fbi to, because the customer wants to pursue it. But we will take right. attribution far enough to understand the tooling and the bot and the locations for the purpose of us being able to better defend our customers if there's a recurrence of that type of uh, attack. And so, yeah, we're going to do a lot of work to pull that together, Alan. To your earlier question, I apologize, I didn't answer that yet. Um, the first attack, the big terabits attack, that appears to, according to the customer, customer, to be more social, political motivated because they host some sites that are considered sensitive by some. Okay. And it seems to be a motivation for that. The, the second attack, the large bit per second, or sorry, packet per second attack, I don't think there is any uh, ransomware or uh, motivation beyond that this particular customer happens to get attacked a lot this particular bank. So they already have a risky footprint and someone went after them. And to your last question about the tooling and coordination, absolutely, that's 
what's really impressive to me, because in the past, there seemed to be a finite amount of attack traffic that was available. So just to use simple, dumb math, you could have 100 gig going to one customer or one gig going to 100 customers. There was some tooling in between the attackers. Right. This one, this person was able to get a hold of those tools onto themselves, right, and launch that attack and use multiple tools from multiple locations around the world. So you're right. Someone put a lot of thought into how they were going to execute both of those attacks. Yeah. I mean, th th you know, the scale is is... It's almost like talking, you know, I don't want to go Carl Sagan on you, but, but it's almost like talking, you know, stars in the universe, right? Billions and billions. Um, I mean, the scale of these attacks, I mean, to, 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 to put, what was it, 800 and something million packets per second onto the net? That's that's horsepower, baby. I mean, that's I mean, that's unheard. You know, it's almost incomprehensible to someone like me. You know, coming from where it is, and and then, but also to push almost one and a half terabits a second of traffic. I mean, I, I guess the obvious question to to you, Roger, is okay. Akamai saw it. You handled it. Congratulations, right? And thank God we have folks like you doing this, but. Are we are we getting to the like you said with the Mirai stuff? There came a, a sort of an equilibrium, not mutually assured destruction, but an equilibrium where the defense can defend against what we saw, right? And are we now coming to the place where we're going to have to kind of redefine the equilibrium? Because if it's at one and a half terabytes now, according to Barranco's law, in two years we're going to see a three terabyte. Right. Yep. And and, you know, will we be sitting here being able to talk about it at that point or does that kind of overwhelm? I mean, there's, you know, there, how much is enough? Yeah. So excellent question. And, you know, when we. Every a couple of times a year, we go through a planning session. And InfoSec is a part of that. And network is a part of that. And, you know, general operations. And we all have our input. So InfoSec looks at the future risk and makes sure that we have a multiple of what they believe the risk level is from a bandwidth and gear handling perspective. Operationally, staffing-wise, tooling-wise, there's a lot of factors that goes into making sure you're well prepared for an event that's years from now. You can't wait for that event to you know, subsequently follow up with preparedness. Right. Yeah. And just like you said before, with the pandemic, you, you used that word earlier. How do we make sure that we're ready to effectively do these things when the staff is working from home and not in the actual SOC? Right. And oh, yeah. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. Yeah. How do we make sure the tooling is safe, is extended, that we're highly effective, our communications are tight, our OLAs and SLAs with our peers are tight so that when we need to engage the knock, you know, it's busy. But. For those huge numbers that you're talking about, Alan, um, there's two prominent groups in the SOC. One is obviously the cybersecurity people. They're going to write the signatures and the ACLs and whatever we need to do to stop the attack, but let the clean traffic through. That's where the magic is, is to let the clean traffic through while stopping the malicious. We also have a group that does nothing but networking because if there's a massive attack coming in, it's going to exhaust segments i'm not saying it's going to exhaust the internet but it's going to exhaust segments of the internet which makes for a bad experience for the customer so we spend a lot of time traffic shaping and we'll move traffic around the globe to find the best subsequent path to hand off traffic so it's an effort to fight these big attacks that goes way beyond just cyber from an intel perspective absolutely and there is a traffic shape. I mean, and that, look, that goes back to what Prolexis was all about, right? And, and that was, you know, in retrospect, is always twenty twenty hindsight, right? It was in a fantastic, amazing uh, acquisition by Akamai, right, to bring that sort of capability, you know, on onto the onto the Akamai network. Um, 
Roger, you mentioned also there was a large attack against AWS. I assume that was outside of Aquamine Network. What do you think is, you know, you gave some reasons for these two specific ones. One might have been uh, hacktivist, if you will, right, for political active. The other just, you know, a, a frequent target. I mean... What is is that going to be the norm? Do you think there's some some something else here at play? You know, so well, one of the trends that when I mentioned before that DDoS kind of trailed off because the, those hacktivists aside, the cyber criminal they just want to make money. So what we saw in the stock yeah. is there was a big shift towards credential abuse. Yeah, massive which, by the way, is probably the most challenging thing to defend against. Is this a bot? Is this a human? Is this expected scraper traffic or not? It's a big deal to, to get that right. Um, so they, I believe people were making more money with that effort than with DDoS or other cyber-type tools, SQL injection or other types of attempts, um, which still goes on a lot, obviously. But sure. they were making more money with the credential abuse effort. So it feels to me like the DDoS component is probably more hacktivist, more I want to be destructive versus what it was a few years ago where they were trying to extort Bitcoin out of enterprises yeah. to prevent an attack. We're seeing less of the extortion. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing more ransomware than we ever did right now, and certainly since COVID and all of that, right, as malware. But DDoS as a way of, you know, putting the gun to the head had, had, had gone away. Just phenomenal stuff. You know, as I said earlier, Roger, thank, thank goodness for you and your team with us, right? I mean, where, where would we, where'd we be with this? Um, and, 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 and also the other thing to remember is, look, you're giving us, you know, the two, the two biggest ones. I'm assuming you're seeing a lot of DDoS activity in general. Any, what about the present COVID situation? Is that exasperate? Other than that, that the SOC folks are working from home and everything. But has that led to a greater wave of, of DDoS, you think? You know, um, I don't think so. And I would have been wrong because I made the assumption that, hey, as brick and mortar businesses have become more dependent on their internet facing services to sell their products, attackers are going to more aggressively go after that. And I really didn't see that uptick on that particular front. Um, so I was wrong with that one. Every once in a while, we're all wrong. Um, even me. <laughs> anyway, hey, Roger, we're about out of time. We're actually over time. But it was such a pleasure catching up with you, man. And I, you know what? As I said, seriously, great job. We all sleep better at night under the blanket of uh, your security there, to quote Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men. But uh, keep up the great work, and, and let don't be a stranger. Come back on and keep us posted what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. I would, I would like that. I'm, I'm passionate about this subject, so I, I know you are talking about it. Great to connect with you again, Alan. All right, you be well. Roger Barranco uh, from Akamai here on Tech Strong TV. This is Alan Schimmel. We're going to be back with our next guest in just a moment. ContainerJournal.com is the leading online destination for centralized computing-related content. ContainerJournal.com covers all aspects of software containers, from container management, data management, for containers, container security, networking for containers, to the entire container ecosystem, Kubernetes, microservices, serverless, and more. ContainerJournal.com has the largest selection of container-related news, featuring breaking news, blog posts, podcasts, and more. Visit www.containerjournal.com to learn more. ContainerJournal.com is operated by MediaOps, Inc., the team behind DevOps.com, Digital Anarchist, SecurityBoulevard.com, DevOps Connect, and DevOpsDozen.com. 
Our next interview features Pradut Roy of Manage Engine, which of course is part of Zoho. Uh, the Manage Engine folks did a, a recent survey with some interesting results. It was good to catch up with Pradut and, and hear more about it. Let's now go to our conversation with Pradut. This is Digital Anarchist. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this segment of Tech Strong TV. Um, in this segment, I'm happy to introduce you to Pradyut Roy. Uh, Pradyut is with Manage Engine. Pradyut, welcome to Tech Strong TV. Hi, Alan. Good morning. Uh, so glad to be here, and uh, thank you for having me today. My, it's our pleasure to have you. Pradyut, why don't you kind of introduce yourself, give a little bit of your background for our audience? Sure, okay. Uh, so my name is Pradyut, like you just mentioned. And uh, I work for Manage Engine. I've been with Manage Engine for the last eight years now. And uh, I'm a product manager at Manage Engine. So I work on the IT service management product of uh, Manage Engine. So if there's anybody who is currently listening and watching, and if you do not like our IT and product, uh, I'm the person who is to be blamed for it. And if you do like it, uh, I'm also the person who is to be blamed for it. But yes, Very so that's, that's, my, that, that's, that's my main job. I work on the product. I listen to customers all day. I take feedback and I make sure that that feedback is incorporated back into the product uh, and uh, make sure that the IT teams the world over have a good product that they can rely on to maintain their IT infrastructures. Excellent, Rajit. Now, Manage Engine is a, is a company or brand within a larger Right, right. It's, it's, it's part yep. of Zoho Corp. It's part of Zoho. So it's a it's the IT management division of Zoho. So Zoho Corp is the main organization, and uh, right. Zoho also makes several other SaaS products like your CRM. Uh, they have their own office suite and uh, marketing automation and a whole bunch of applications. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Manage Engine brand is specifically dealing with the IT management software. So we did not want to mix the two. Uh, so we do not want to overwhelm our users by bringing in more complexity into the portfolio. So we wanted to keep them separate. So if anybody has any IT management requirement, they know that they have to look into the managing side of Zoho. And if they need any business applications, the Zoho.com suite is for them. That's what I was looking for. Thanks, Fredjit. All right. Let's jump in. Um, you, uh, Manage Engine recently released the results of a survey that you guys had yes. done around ITSM and, and kind of what's been going on with COVID and everything and, you know, remote working and how, how that's affected ITSM. Um, right. Why did you guys do the survey, first of all? Uh, so I think one of the first things we wanted to do that was really understand the lay of the land. I mean, where exactly are our users currently at, right? And this is not, uh, I mean, uh, business as usual. We understand that everything is now changed. And uh, even the way we communicate with our users, even the way we communicate with our prospects or people who are evaluating new IT products, it has all changed. Their priorities have changed. Uh, the business decisions uh, are now, you know, based on different parameters now. Uh, what exactly are they looking for uh, with regards to their IT infrastructure requirements? What are the new priorities is what we wanted to understand. So in, in part, it all actually began from there. We wanted to understand how the priorities realigned. Uh, what are they currently now focusing on or did their current IT infrastructure setup help them out in this particular transition? Uh, were they future proof in that sense? Were they able to make the transition to remote work in an easy manner? Did they have to go through a lot of trouble? And uh, if they did go through trouble, uh, what were the kind of remedial actions they took uh, to you know, address that as quickly as possible? So we wanted to understand that and uh, because that would in part also from a very selfish point of view help us build uh, products in a way so that they could actually use in a better way excellent excellent okay um let's get into the results you know and, and so Purdue, i should tell you I, I look at a lot of surveys here right between devops.com and container journal security boulevard um i always like to say hey a good survey should have at least three key findings that people want to focus in on. So I'm going to ask if you don't mind. Give me at least three, if you've got five, even better. But three to start, key findings or key areas that you want to, that we think, you know, our audience would like to hear about. All right, sure. Uh, so I think I'll start out with the positives first, right? I think from what we understood is 
the IT teams were able to manage this transition very, very well in the sense that for the larger part, they did take initiative. They did take the right steps to make this transition easy for the majority of the workforce. So in our findings, I think what we had was I think majority stated that like the ITSM function really kind of stepped up and uh, it is still effective in a remote manner or rather when uh, your work is actually moved into a remote work uh, like, you know, realm. And uh, then there's this other area which we also understood or rather found out was security and uh, related areas are a little bit of a concern. And uh, even though there's not enough effort being put in over there, I think it is now being done in a very backdated manner. I think uh, that's that's something which a lot of teams are not really prepared to handle. And uh, BYOD policies was actually also a surprise for us because uh, more than 50% of the organizations did not really have a BYOD policy. And what is now happening as a result of that is a lot of organizations are now having to come up with new policies when everybody is working remotely, right? It's, it's not the same when all of these devices were within your own security or network perimeter. And you now have to do all of these as different in a very distributed manner. So I think these were some interesting findings that we've actually uh, had, I think, during the course of this particular survey. And obviously not to forget, like, you know, the creep up in shadow IT and all of it, which is to be expected. I mean, those are really on expected lines. But I think the good news really is that IT kind of held up, uh, IT service management held up. And uh, I think by and large, they did okay. Excellent. So I don't disagree. I, I mean, certainly, you know, there was no choice, right? <laughs> and so when, when your choice is work from home or remote or don't work at all, Right, you work you from home or remote. You would work yeah. from home, right? And I, I think for for the ITSM uh, uh, managers, administrators, I think the choice became: look, we're we're operating in less in less than ideal circumstances. So, and, and in those kinds of scenarios, typically you have your must-haves and your nice-to-haves. The nice to haves become very optional, right? I mean, in, in, and, and we focus in on what our must haves are, right? And, and then figure out how to make those must haves happen. Um, just curious, what do you think maybe some of these, you know, where was the line? Give us an example of, of where ITSM said, okay, well, maybe we will kind of relax things on this or, you know, that's a nice to have, but we may not be able to do it here versus things you, like you mentioned BYOD, for instance, right? Uh, many organizations did not have BYOD policies. They didn't have to worry about it. People were using equipment in, you know, in the office. It was company equipment. How, you know, beyond answering, did you put a BYOD policy in place? Um, how, how did they cope with that? If, if you uh, so I think got it, it. It, it, it. It's happening now in a very, uh, let's say, post the shift to this remote and distributed manner of working. I think organizations kind of scrambled uh, to look for solutions which are going to help them do this. And uh, a part of this is also the movement to the cloud, right? I mean, it's interesting you brought up the must-have and the nice-to-have, uh, you know, segmentation. Uh, a lot of organizations, not, till not to recently, really thought of a lot of cloud services and cloud applications as nice-to-have. They were not entirely convinced of its advantage or rather what it can actually bring to the table. And uh, for various reasons, some could have regu uh, regulations and compliance reasons. Some could probably just not be comfortable with it. Or some thought it was just not an effort worth taking at that particular point of time. And these were nice to have initiatives, which were probably kept at the bottom of the list. And once this movement to the cloud actually has uh, to the work from home happened, a lot of these nice to have initiatives, which were initially put at the uh, bottom of the barrel, suddenly kind of came up uh, to the surface and have now become must haves, right? You are now using a lot of cloud applications, either for your meetings or for your email or for your whatever be it, your different productivity applications and things like that. So in this regard, I think uh, this this scramble has happened, and thankfully IT teams were able to make that switch very quickly. Uh, largely because the vendor landscape is massive, not just managed engine. There's many other vendors out there which can actually uh, like you know support the use cases which a lot of in a very 
uh, quick manner. And I think to cre credit really to the IT teams really very, very quickly on, uh, on, on that front. Yeah, no, they've been agile, nimble. I, I think, yeah. you know, I think when we look at the move to cloud with, uh, right. under this, you know, under these circumstances, th there's, there's a couple of different kind of pieces of it. One is adoption of SaaS. I mean, I, I think it became very, very clear to people that SaaS applications were kind of the way to go. Right, doing exactly. sort of, you know, the idea of running a, uh, it's kind of, you know, the non SaaS traditional sort of app, it's not going to work in this, or it's going to be very difficult in in these circumstances. So I think we're seeing tremendous movement towards a SaaS adoption model, but you know that's where the application is in the cloud and you access it from home. I think another piece of that is how we access information in the cloud so many organizations were set up you know spoken wheel where if you weren't in the office you vpn back in you know to an office that then right. pumped you back out to the cloud when you came from out here anyway and and i think that that's something that's still going to play itself out Prajut. i i think it you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Because a lot of organizations still have not really figured out how to handle the security aspect of the, sec uh, the cloud moment. Uh, mm -hmm. That is probably when solutions like the CASB, you know, the cloud access security broker, and tools like that yeah. are going to come in handy. And uh, it's, it's I, I think now a lot of vendors who were initially a little hesitant, uh, sorry, a lot of organizations which were hesitant to move or make that move to the cloud are going to take a very serious look towards tools like CASB and uh, other such solutions which can actually make this transition to the cloud in a much more secure and give them some sort sure. of peace of mind that not everything is lost. Yeah. You know, I think some people, again, must, must have, nice to have. I think some people said, look, we can't wholesale kind of just change in midstream here in the middle of all this. We're still going to have to spoke and wheel it. But as soon as they get the opportunity, they're going to migrate away from that because it, it just, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and then I think there's putting data in the cloud, right? That's separate from just SaaS, using SaaS apps, separate from access. Moving payloads to cloud, I, I think is, and maybe that's not consumer end users and within an organization. I think that's the IT people themselves who are saying, hey, we need to move these payloads in a in a workable, you know, with using ITSM kind of guidelines, parameters in a, in a, in a safe way, in a safe, secure way. And, and I think that's still, that's still playing out right, you know, as right under us here, right, as it's happening. It is. I think uh, so data is important. I mean, like in the industry, every organization would probably want to safeguard everything uh, which they own. I mean, they, they hold it dear, and a lot of organizations are still not too comfortable by giving out their data or rather putting it in some sort of a public cloud. Uh, there's a lot of regulations and compliances which SaaS vendors still have to, I mean, I, I think it's a good thing, uh, SaaS vendors have to comply with. And uh, more such regulations and more such compliances come in. The onus is really on the vendors, I mean, the makers of these products to convince these IT technicians and organizations that, you know what, I think we're going to help you move your on-premises data into the cloud, uh, have all of these payloads and have all of, have all of your organization data move into the cloud. Uh, security is one. And the other major concern with a lot of cloud and SaaS applications is the availability, right? You right. need to have some sort of data loss prevention mechanisms. I mean, you need to have a backup. You need to assure availability at all times. You need to have your server response like that. I mean, it, it, it should be super fast. You need to have your proper caching. Uh, you need to make sure that you're serving the customer from your nearest data center and not from somewhere across the world. So these are, I think the onus of this part is on the vendor than actually on the, uh, like, you know, the IT technician really. So their decision really is to make sure that they have identified the right IT uh, maker, the vendor for them. And the onus then moves on to the vendor to provide the uh, assured services so that the organization does not suffer. Fair. Absolutely. So, Pradyat, let, let, Pradyat let's turn back to the survey. You, you gave us sort of the, the good news. But, you know, 
what what was some of the what was some of the bad news or you know some of the findings that maybe showed maybe some trouble spots um so I think one of the areas where we didn't really see encouraging signs was there was not enough, uh, you know, business continuity plan. I mean, not too many organizations had a solid business continuity yeah. plan or a disaster recovery plan, if I may call it that, for emergency situations. And this has really been the mother of all emergencies, right? I mean, uh, you you prepare for a worst case scenario, and uh, this virus has shown you what the worst case scenario can look like. And uh, not many organizations were prepared for it. And the consequence of that was there would have been, you know, there has been a surge or rather an, a temporary surge, so to say, of a lot of pressure on IT teams to immediately grapple with these L1 tickets and a lot of employees now not really knowing what to do. And uh, a lot of that also has got to do with a lot of teams not really having proper knowledge base articles. Right? Documentation has always been that uh, Achilles heel of many teams, be it engineering or IT teams or whatever. A well-built knowledge base, a well-built self-service portal is half the battle won for many IT teams, right? Because you're kind of okay. reflecting a lot of tickets which could come your way uh, into the knowledge base, which can, I mean, and point them towards an article uh, where you've already solved the problem for somebody. So a lot of organizations did not really have a well-built uh, self-service portal uh, in the sense that they didn't have the knowledge base populated too well. And by extension, uh, the disaster recovery plan or having a proper business continuity plan uh, was not really too prevalent in, in, in many organizations. And that kind of exposed their weaknesses and that kind of made them a little vulnerable, vulnerable during this transition. And uh, yeah, that's that's a worrying trend. I, I hope during the course of the last few weeks, I think that has been addressed. And if we probably do a relook or maybe revisit the survey, uh, people who we've spoken to in the last few months and maybe speak to them in the next six, six months, uh, I'm sure we're going to see a different uh, pattern and a different result. But uh, like you know, when we're going to do that, I agree. I agree. I think a lot of people. So I live here in South Florida, right? And we get bad hurricane, you know, storms. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know, almost every year, and and so companies down here typically have a disaster recovery plan where, if the office is taken out, electricity is down, data centers down, you know, local data center down. Um, but true business continuity plans, right? Not just disaster recovery, but business continuity. How do we work remote? How do we move stuff to cloud versus you know local? I, I think a lot of companies saw that as a checkbox, and and maybe they had some you know some old contingency stuff that hasn't been updated in five years or ten years or if they ever did it. And I I, I agree. I I think this has been a wake up call that number one. Lesson number one, you can't make your contingency plan as you live it, right? You, you're kind of making it up as you go. You're bound to make mistakes. You know, uh, uh, an ounce of, the old saying that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, of cure, right? If you, if you put it together, it'll really serve you well because you don't know when the next – it may not be a pandemic next time. It might be something else. But you don't know when the next – disaster or, or situation arises yeah i mean it need not be a, a global emergency like the one which we are facing right i mean it, it could still be like you mentioned a, a flood somewhere or a hurricane somewhere yeah. uh, even if you localize it and even if you look at it at a very micro level it need not be a global epidemic like what is happening right now uh, for your own self-sustenance i think you need to have that plan wherein if there is a situation where your entire organization has to work remotely or always prepare for the worst case scenario. And uh, I think that's that's really been uh, something which a lot of organizations have, that's that's a lesson which a lot of organizations have actually learned now, right? I mean, no matter what the organization is, I think they now have a worst case scenario to prepare for. Absolutely, absolutely. Pradeet, we're, we're almost out of time. Any other uh, findings on the survey you want to bring up? Uh, so I think, uh, I, I'd want to close it again on a happy note in the sense that there's very few uh, section of uh, like, you know, the people who we've spoken to were not too happy with the way the IT teams have actually handled this whole situation. So I think for the large part, IT teams have managed to like, you know, raise to the occasion, even though some of them are not readily uh, 
prepared for some of uh, the situations. They did manage to like you know uh, take initiative and fix the gaps or plug the holes in the ensuing weeks, really to make sure that business is now back up and running. So I think yeah, I probably want to uh, close or rather my closing marks really would be is that I think the IT teams of the world over really have been able to handle this in a very successful manner. I agree. The internet has been a hero of this, right? A bright spot. It, it's performed remarkably well with very, right. relatively speaking, very few breaks. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. IT teams have, you know what? It, it may not be 100%. As we said, you get nice-to-haves and right. must-haves. But they, they've kept the wheels moving and the lights on, and, and that's what you, it's what you need from this. You know what we didn't mention, Pradyut? For people who want to get more information, where on the survey, Manage Engine, where do they go? Uh, it's right up there on the website, uh, panasengine.com slash service dis plus or service plus And we'll have more results of that. Uh, there's going to be a banner of the results on there. And uh, there's a report published with our uh, analysis on it. So if anybody's looking for that, I think that's the place to go to. Fantastic. Hey, Pradyut Roy, thank you so much for being our guest on TechStrong TV thank and so sharing much. with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. All righty. Hey, this is Alan Schimmel. Thank you. This is Alan Schimmel for TechStrong TV. We're going to be right back with our next guest. With our next guest. Next up is our Something Old from the Archives. It's from TechStrongCon just last month. And this one features Christina Pinella of Red Hat, who gave a great session on reimagining ways of working across the organization for improved business outcomes. It's about digital transformation, why it's imperative, and what you got to do now to make it happen. Christina does a great job on this session. I hope you'll enjoy it. Let's now go to Christina Pinella of Red Hat from TechStrongCon. Hello, and thank you for joining me today uh, to discuss reimagining ways of working across the organization for improved business outcomes. I want to thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to present uh, at their conference today with you guys, and I hope you enjoy our uh, discussion. So I'm Chris Pinella, and I am director of Red Hat Open Innovation Labs. We are part of uh, the consulting arm of Red Hat. We're a strategic group that we work collaborati collaboratively with customers and executives uh, through the management tiers, really working on um, organizational change and process around adopting new ways of working. A lot of our customers you know, are migrating legacy systems to new platforms and technologies. My team really is tied to helping them figure out better ways of working while they're adopting these tools and how those effects ripple out really through the organization. Now, many organizations in, in the past months, including my own, have gone from this collaborative co-working spaces, you know, where it's easy to get up and walk and ask your coworkers a question. You know, you had some, you know, FaceTime with folks that you were working with generally to really this, right? We're all working from home in different areas. <clears throat> I'm coming to you from the attic of my house, uh, was one of the quieter places I was able to record this, but recognizing our worlds have changed quite dramatically in the past few months. A lot of my day job was flying on airplanes, meeting with our customers and getting to visit offices. And I find myself you know, in this similar situation. And one of the things that, you know, this has really caused is disruption across a lot of our customers and quite possibly in some scenarios, some chaos from what we've been observing. Now, disruption is not necessarily a bad thing. Yes, there were some factors and external, um, you know, enablers where we couldn't see some of the situation that we're in coming from. However, disruption, if you think about it, is part of transformation. And the way that we've been looking at it is it's an opportunity really to improve your connections between your people now that they're not able to actually connect with one another in person and take some steps to make changes. 
you know, in terms of making your technologies more flexible, in terms of creating better connections with your folks. There was a lot we took to, for granted, I think, sitting just in office spaces and maybe just with our ways of working. And our current situation, I believe, just creates an opportunity for us to, to relook at how we can be better. And quite honestly, if we can conquer um, thinking about you know, transformation as part of the disruption, if we have an opportunity to come back together, we're gonna to be so far ahead of other organizations that you'll be able to meet things like your customer value that much quicker. Now, I recognize most organizations are not designed to embrace disruption and think about accelerating their transformation. You know, a lot of them that we talk to have hierarchical reporting structures and governance models that are inflexible, really just opaque communications. Not everyone is sure about what's happening along different product lines or different parts of the organization and just tightly coupled legacy technology overall. So, you know, this is really disruptive, the situation that we're in because some of this just doesn't work anymore quite honestly, for our customers, for your teams, you know, for things that you may be experiencing. But all is not lost. What if we flip the paradigm? You know, this is a great time to stop and think about what if, how might we, how could this change? To really think about how we could come together better as teams, as an organization, to actually get work done and keep folks connected and committed and you know, leverage their creativity and have them be collaborative. Now, this does definitely take some effort. And you know, we recognize that every organization is different in kind of where they are and how they're working. Um, you know, part of one of the great things about my job is I have a chance to take a broad spectrum of look across our customers across different business models, different market verticals, just different ways of working. And folks are, you know, figuring out, you know, from the customers that I talk to, you know, how could we do this? How could we look at loosening our connections, creating more adaptive environments for ourselves to work in as our business continues to change almost on a daily basis? How do we actually communicate now better and maybe more transparently because we can't be face to face? And how do we foster innovation and adaptation? If I talk across an organization and opportunities where I've had from executive levels to teams, everyone has an idea of how to make things better. It's really about creating that path and direction for allowing it to really shine through across the different levels and tiers of the organization. Now, you know, again, just looking across our customer verticals, folks are really starting to come out of what we, what we were calling the business continuity phase. That's really keeping the lights on. Does our VPN support everyone working from home? Do we have enough software licenses for folks to be able to get work done? Can our customers still access core functionality of the business that we're running and offering? And really going into brilliant, what we call business resiliency. Now, resiliency includes continuity in my mind, but it also is more of a framework for responding and adapting through the change that we're going through. So yeah, we figured out how to keep the lights on and you know, our teams are, you know, have some amount of comfort in their environment and how they're working. Okay, markets are changing. We may not be able to come back together as a team. How do we just continue to move our company, our business, and move forward with what our customers need overall in the market. One of the resounding themes that I've heard from customers is, how do we never allow this to happen again? If you think back to any of the business continuity plans you may have been part of, it really probably did not take into account a pandemic and the amount of disruption that is occurring you know, within all of these industries with across the globe, whether it's government, to travel, to medical, to banking, everyone is going through a tremendous amount of change and really folks are realizing our business continuity plans were really not in many cases up to really to meet the challenge. So they're asking us as they're looking you know, for guidance, 
you know, how, do, how can we better improve our ways of working as we very quickly need to change direction sometimes and modernize and, and move forward with our product sets that we're offering customers. So what can we do today? Again, this is an opportunity in my mind. This is an opportunity when we talk to, when I talk to my customers about looking for ways to make improvements and really make a change. So where do you wanna start? Well, okay, let's think about the biggest pain points through the levels of the organization and how does that map and impact your customer value? You know, I mentioned about hierarchical reporting structures. It means maybe your customer needs aren't being put first. Inflexible governance models may be delays in increasing incremental value out to them. Maybe your organizations are not aligned on what the direction should be moving forward. And your tightly coupled technology is creating a domino effect if, if, something, if something fails. And now I've had a customer actually spoke to a, a CIO a couple weeks ago of a small medical company. And he said to me, on a good day, in the office, in those cubicles, our teams had challenges communicating and collaborating. Our infrastructure and application code is so tightly coupled that if one thing fails, it causes a tier one outage for at least four hours, meaning our customers aren't being served. So those are, I mean, very obvious pain points where you can start to look at, if you're willing to do some introspection, how to, pos how to approach improving them. However, it's important to acknowledge that everyone gets distracted as well. You know, your teams are operating in a new model. Everyone is at home. You know, I mentioned I'm sitting in my attic. We are experiencing when we're working with our customers, you know, 60 to 90 minutes is really the edge of where folks are able to focus and concentrate. So how do we distill down looking at some of these challenges into you know, tangible little buckets where folks can concentrate, make progress, you know, have the ability to step back, whether there's children or dog walking and, you know, then return back and, and continue to focus. So it's just an important thing to acknowledge as, you know, you're going forward within your organization, because it is another piece of, you know, thinking about the way that people work and teams work together. Now, we've come up with six factors for looking at once you've identified, you know, something that you, a gap, a pain point that you would want to work on. And a lot of this is focused around building trust and common purpose within your organization. Now, this can be, this is, these are factors that work up at the executive management level through the team level. And, you know, I work and have a chance to speak with folks across all of these different tiers within organizations. And these same factors are just important across the board. There are things that you can, these you can take at the team level, you can take them up through the middle management, and they definitely um, are resonating at the executive level. So we're gonna go through these. Um, and let me walk you through at a high level kind of what everything is here. Um, first, establish a clear vision with goals. And we're going to talk about why that's important. Focus on your customer experience. Now, customers, multiple levels, could be internal, could be external. You know, who are your customers? Build some cross-organizational teams and processes. Now, again, we'll talk through kind of how we approach this and, you know, where there's some I I ideas for you to look at. Identify areas for self-management and leadership within your teams. You know, your governance models have changed just by fact that you're not face-to-face. -face. So how can you encourage and build some trust through this? Invest in your people. You know, the ways that we've been working and doing business, you know, now and as you're looking to move forward, you're going to need some new, some training, some upskilling, some different tools. You know, it's important to remember the, that you're asking folks to change. You need to be able to support them to do that. And then create a process for communication and feedback. You know, that's also important. You know, as we are more distributed and remote, really building in that framework of how, you're, how and when you're communicating with, you know, organizations, teams, management levels, uh, to bring more transparency in is going to be, a, you know, a critical piece to achieving your overall vision and goals. 
So establish a clear shared vision, the first item on our list here. What is a great vision? A great vision is future focused and directional, specific and relevant, value based, unique, memorable, and you know, it should be motivating and challenging. It's the why. Why are we going to do this? Why at the team level do we want to undertake this? Or why is this an initiative that you know, it want, the management tiers want to work on? Or why are the executives making this change? Now, <laughs> when I ask um, organizations about what their why is, you know, a lot of, quite a few times I'm, when I've had the ability to be face-to-face -face with folks, you know, we, they talk about the needs for organizations to change, to modernize, to, to be you know, more efficient and work better together. And I say, why? And a lot of times I get back, well, we have to change, or a board is asking us to change, or you know, our technology is driving the fact that we have to change. That's not really a great why. On the other hand, I've had CIOs tell me, and I had one this happened about six months ago, where he said, you know, our why is that we really want to increase our stock value by 20% in the next year. And I said to him, what value is that to your actual teams and employees? <laughs> and he didn't have a great answer for that, but it just shows you that, you know, when you're thinking about a why, you want it to be motivational and you want it to be something that folks can rally around and believe in. So, you know, technology falling over, stock prices, or even yet, what, a few weeks ago, I had a team tell me, well, we want to retire soon. I'm like, okay, still not a great why, but definitely something we can drive towards as you know, a goal and an outcome of the work that you're doing. Uh, so just some examples of you know, when folks think about why, what's gonna, what's gonna motivate and, and challenge the folks that you're working with, whether it's as a team or middle management or executive level. Now this vision should have some, some KPIs, some, some focus on your business outcomes. You know, if you're looking to redo a process or rewrite an application or take on, you know, a larger initiative where you're looking at maybe decoupling a whole product suite, what's the business outcome on top of it? It's going to improve something or decrease something or allow, you know, X amount of functionality that brings business value that drives business outcomes. And those are, you know, things that should be thought about at the outset because they give you the guardrails as well as to what to think about measuring as a team as you're going through, um, you know, working on whatever, you know, pain point or challenge that you've decided upon. Now focus on customer experience. And I love this map. This is the Rail Europe map. It's from about 2012. And one of the things that I really think is so strong in this map is it shows you all of the opportunities for customer touch points. Now, it doesn't matter if your customer is internal, if you're an IT developer and you're, you're serving like a marketing team or a finance team with internal systems, or your customer, external customer focused, you know, retail or medical claims or something, understanding all of the opportunities where you interact with your customers and thinking about how to improve their experience and make it better. Whether it's, you know, some things as simple as internal where if you are spending 20 minutes running, you know, kicking off a report because it's not automated and your marketing team is spending another hour on top of it, culling through the data because it's not in a great format for what they need. A simple, you know, taking the time to think about, okay, if I you know, automated this and it came out in the format, that would not only save me 20 minutes out of my day and I could go work on something else, uh, you know, value add, it would save you know, the marketing team an hour out of their day and you know, they could be doing likewise. So you know, it's about understanding the context as well in terms of where and how that you're working. Now, we're all playing the infinite game with our customers. We want to support them in terms of what they need during their journey, whether it's internal or external, and recognizing it's always changing, and especially in the past 
few months, it's probably even more dramatically changed where we're trying to think about, you know, we want to continue these long-term relationships with them. You know, how do you build better trust internally if you're working within teams? How do you continue to build trust with your external customers? What, what are the drivers? What do, what do they need? And I, this is something everyone, I believe, within an organization, you know, could and, and should be thinking about because you want them to come back and work with you internally. You want them to come back to your business and to your product. So what can you do to better serve them than you did yesterday? And it's a challenge to stop and think about, you know, I may need to change my ways of working or we may need to change direction, but it's worth stopping and thinking through a little bit about are there small changes that we could make to do this? Now look at building cross organizational teams. Now, <laughs> this is my team and I'm, I'm very lucky. They're pretty well um, formed and normalized working virtually and remotely. We do this as part of the work that we do. Um, we've been bringing our customers along on the journey about you know, how, to, how to have them better you know, work together as well. It really goes towards you know, building trust. Now, look at the fact this, at this image. You're learning quite a bit about folks, whether you realize it or not on this video call. Everyone's sitting in their house, in two people's living rooms or basements, you know, the walls behind them. You're getting a peek into their lives beyond just you know, your working relationship. And those start to build kind of the foundations of conversation and trust. Oh, I see there's some interesting books on the bookshelf behind you. What kind of plant is that? Kind of opening up those communication and collaboration channels a little bit, but also having tools to support you. You know, recognizing, again, we need things like digital whiteboards and video conferencing and, you know, making sure that folks can see work as it happens, um, you know, regardless of the situation. So, you know, when we think about this, we work across countries, we work across management tiers, across functions and across teams. Where's the right starting point for you, you know, in terms of what you and how you could be working? You know, it's okay to start small and you should start small and maybe the team level is the right place to start where you're looking at different ways of kind of changing your process and thinking about how you're doing business and kind of building, looking what it takes to build trust and kind of begin to radiate out some of the communication and look at different ways that the functionality comes together. This is important. Why is, so building teams, I will say, you know, and what we've seen in the field recently is incredibly important because I had another VP a couple of weeks ago as we were kicking off an, a call with them say, you know, on a good day, my teams were having trouble collaborating across their, you know, across, you know, them just working together in an office, they weren't prepared to be remote and distributed. And it took them a few weeks to realize that they needed to step back and take a look at the way that they were working because it was the way that they were currently working was costing them so much time to release value out to the customer it was costing them money, literally leaving money on the table, revenue they could be making, all because they were too stubborn for a few weeks to just stop and be like, this isn't working. And we really need to go back and relook at what we can do as an organization to make this better. So this is where looking at opportunities to develop leadership and self-governance come in. Now, when I say self-governance, I do not mean autonomous. I mean, your teams are part of an organization, a broader organization. A lot of times folks take autonomy and it's like, oh, we're just gonna go off and do all these different things. No, you're part of a, recognize you're all part of a wider organization and there is going to be rippling impacts. So how do you look for, you know, empowering teams, allowing folks to work outside their comfort zone and, and the current process constraints? enable and support them. It's really about building, you know, the guardrails around what first you want the teams to be working on and just allowing them some time to, to think about how they could best do it themselves. 
and then the communication cadence out about how they're doing on it. So, you know, when our teams are working with customers, we're, we're demoing, we're promoting, you know, asking questions in chat channels, we're, you know, sending out, you know, images with our status reports, we're inviting people in for office hours, and empow really empowering them to say, here's how we're getting work done, and here's where we may need some help, and here's where we're running into, you know, we're having some successes, and how does this work upstream or fit into the, to the larger picture. Leadership and innovative ideas can come from anywhere within your organization. Like I said, when I'm on the ground at customers, I hear ideas coming from individual contributors from team levels where they're like, wow, we have an idea. How do, how do we get ourselves heard? Can we contribute? Can, can you help us with this idea? Really, again, Everyone has an idea of like how they possibly could make their day and their job better. We need to facilitate and foster champions at management levels to like encourage them because no one has all the answers right now. I look to my team for answers. You know, I look outside of my team and, you know, kind of see what's going on, not only within our, you know, working groups at Red Hat across our different departments. Look, I talk to our customers and see where they're looking for their ideas from, because right now it's about, you know, kind of feeding the best and bringing forth, you know, things that, you know, truly could help and make our, our transitions and our transformations that much smoother going forward. So develop and train your folks. This is, I mean, also important. Now, you know, there's lots of opportunities for you know, e-learning, there's lots of opportunities for, you know, still kind of pure one-on-one -on -one learning across the tools that we have. Take a look at where you are and where you would like to be and understand where the gaps are in your current competencies. You want to encourage folks to continually learn. One of the most, you know, scary things sometimes for us when we go into organizations is a lot of long-standing folks haven't had an opportunity to learn something new on the job in at least five years, sometimes 15. And a lot of them are hungry and interested. Some of them are nervous because they don't know what it means to their day-to-day -day job. But they're interested and inquisitive, and you want to encourage that. You want to encourage folks to be continually learning so they're bringing those best practices through. Now, what do we need to learn, you know, now or for the near term? How do we focus where folks are actually undertaking maybe some upskilling or just looking at kind of new processes and ways of working? It's really based off of, again, your initiatives, your goals, and kind of what you want to tackle first. And this, again, can be team level, individual level. It doesn't have to be like organization-wide. You really want to start with some proof points before you scale too quickly so you can learn from them. You know, not all of your current processes and tools are probably inadequate. Most organizations aren't. A lot of things that are homegrown or that work for organizations, if they're working for them, great. That's, that's good to hear. It means they understand how they fit into the overall strategy and life cycle and, you know, why there isn't a need to disrupt them or change them. So it's not like a, a zero-sum game where you're starting from ground zero and moving forward. There are things within every organization that can be built upon that, that do work for them. Now, it is, you know, I've had the opportunity back when we could travel to meet with um, a series of CIOs over a few dinners. This was, you know, um, like I said, a couple months ago across different verticals and spectrums. And when we were talking about, you know, kind of organizational change and why it was important and how this fit into the overall transformation, you know, I was asking them about why, you know, why, what was driving their need. And one of the things that they said is retention was very important to them. Our, their associates, their team members are subject matter experts in how their business is run. And they want to do, they're looking for ways to, continue to get folks to be interested and motivated and staying put in the company so it could help grow the business and bring it forward. Replacing, you know, subject matter experts is very expensive from an organizational standpoint. And so that was a chief concern from these CIOs who are arranging retail, healthcare, automotive, 
um, government, you know, how do we continue to enable and grow our teams to help us move the business forward? And now even more than ever, you know, we're starting to accelerate. What does that look like? And then communication and feedback cadence. No one wants to be working in a tunnel, in a black hole. That's not, you know, when you're thinking about piloting on even small teams, you want some level of transparency because again, you want to show folks what's possible. What's, what, how do you, you know, how's your progress moving forward? What can you possibly, you know, do or learn from what's happening on the smaller scale? You also want to, you know, keep folks excited and motivated. You know, if you are working at the team level, if you're starting with a team and you're showing that, you know, you're making progress and folks are interested in the work you're doing, it's going to create more excitement within your organization. Hey, if they're doing it, maybe I can do it. Or can I get in as part of this? Or how do we expand on this? You also want to keep your teams who are working together connected. Um, you know, we are working with clients right now where some of the programs that we have going on, they're finding it effective to set up an hour in the morning where they're peer programming together, go off on their own for a few hours and come back towards the end of the day for another hour and come back. And they're finding that is a really great way to keep them connected. And the work is, you know, moving forward, you know, across the initiatives, some teams, you know, are just comfortable, you know, working on Slack or other chat channels where, you know, they connect in person over video chat, maybe a little less frequently, but they're in constant communication through their chat channels. And then they're pr propagating out, you know, questions into like a wide, into the wider organization or back to other teams, subject matter experts. And then sharing, sharing is important because again, things, you know, don't always go perfectly. We have, you know, when we work with customers, a lot of them are bringing together, you know, as they're building these cross-functional teams, they're groups that maybe have never worked together before. I've had a few that have never met each other. There's going to be some learnings organizationally about how things will and won't work. And it's really from the, the learnings that you kind of start to see where as you take, take out change to scale, what you're going to need to address or work on or make some, some revisions and tweaks to. So, you know, sharing office hours are, you know, another easy way to do this within teams, you know, sending out communication and inviting feedback, sharing demos, really just looking for ways to bring, you know, keep your team communicating and bringing in some transparency across all of your tiers so that you've got the support of, oh, you know, this change, we're, we're, they're moving quickly and we're learning a little bit and we recognize we may need to, you know, change some other things downstream to support them. It keeps everybody in sync and moving forward. So trust is the glue of life. I love this quote by Stephen Covey. He wrote seven habits of highly effective um, people. And he really was, trust was one of the big um, themes it's an essential ingredient for effective communication, and it's a foundational principle that holds relationships together. Whether you're working at the team level, whether you're working in, through the middle management tiers, or whether you're a line of executives, and it's hard to build. I have had a room full of executives back when we could be in rooms, walk into a meeting and introduce themselves to one another. So. They were a distributed company. Their headquarters were dispersed across the United States. Some of them had never met, had never worked together. They had no foundation of trust. They had no foundation of alignment. And it, you know, quite honestly, we spend a lot of time with them helping facilitate some of the, those foundational conversations to get them moving forward. So if you're not in an, in an organization that has some you know, modicum of trust or way to begin looking at building them, you're, you're not going to be able to build the foundations on top of that to really be able to be successful in a lot of your initiatives. And yes, it's an intangible and it's not really some way that you can measure, you know, trust zero to trust 100. The way that you see it's a faceting 
is through these other ways, through communication, through work getting done, through teams coming together, through it rippling up and down across your organization. So how do you create this path from kind of reimagining to reality? Again, identify the gap you want to work on. Radiate that information to create a movement. Ping your ideas off of a few different groups. Get feedback. Support and champion the change. You know, you really want folks to get excited. Um, you want them to, you know, to cooperate and to work with you and to collaborate and to, to provide input. Take action day by day. Things may not move as quickly as you expect. You're going to learn a lot on this journey. And evaluate and adjust as required. Again, it's about just being aware and empathetic to the fact that we're going to try this and we're going to just see, you know, we're going to see how it goes within these guardrails. And you're going to just make slight pivots and changes as things are working or things you're learning from. But then lastly, celebrate your progress. The fact that you're trying something and learning from it, it's giving you a great narrative. It's giving you a chance to acknowledge uh, all of the, the hard work and effort that your team members, you know, you, your teams, you know, management is making. And that's an important factor to just you know, stop and recognize overall. A lot of companies just kind of plow forward and you know, at the end of, you know, a sprint increment or sometimes at the end of a couple of months, we'll stop, you know, and meet with, you know, the, the organization and say, okay, let's look at how far you've come. Doing, looking at change and undergoing this transformation, you started here and now you're over here. And, you know, just kind of showcasing that is a great way to just people stop and like, wow, we did that? oh, wow, that's great. And they get excited and they want to do more. So, you know, simple tenants from getting you from, okay, where we are now in our, our disruption and how do we need to transform and where can we start looking on a, you know, small fashion to how do we, you know, propagate and celebrate some of the work that we've done, you know, moving forward as we're, we're undergoing this. So I'm going to leave you all with a question. What could you do today? You know, what, where are there, you know, initiatives where you could look at creating some more adaptive environments, loosening up some of the connections that will make you, facilitate you, allowing you to be um, better ways of working within your teams, within your organization? How could you foster and facilitate transparent communications? and really support innovation and adaption because we don't know quite honestly what the next you know few months or where we're going are going to be however regardless of what reemergence looks like for us for industry for you know the roles that you're in understanding how to be adaptable within the ever changing environment again is going to put you ahead of your competitors, it's you're going to better serve your customers wherever they may be, and it'll probably allow and invariably allow you better job um, satisfaction and just working with your teams. So think small, think about you know within your realm, within your day to day, what could you do? How could you you know improve things and you know support change as we're all moving forward? So thank you for attending today. I hope you found the content valuable and to some takeaways for you to use uh, moving forward in your day-to-day -day lives. I look forward to hearing from you. Good luck. All right. It's that time of the show now where we do the news. Um, headlines from around the, the sites. We have a lot today. It's been a little you know, things are getting back to normal in terms of uh, news and, and the flow of, of announcements and what's happening. So let me run these by you real quickly here. Uh, from DevOps.com, we have a good article on how to calculate ROI on infrastructure automation. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a great believer in ROI calculators, but have a look at the article. It may be of use to you. Um, how to use microservices to evolve DevOps pipelines. Great article. Do check that out. Um, 
a little article Commvault announces that they've extended Data Protection Alliance with Microsoft, and that's over in the IT is code section of DevOps.com. Um, we have a, a, a report on a survey: businesses modernizing apps in wake of pandemic. I, I can obviously see that, and then some good news coming out of our, the, our friends at Kong and the CNCF. They've donated the Kuma uh, service mesh to the CNCF, so I think this is the third mesh service that CN, at least three that I know of, that uh, CNCF is now uh, managing. So good, good news there. I, big fans of CNCF. Um, over on Container Journal, Diamante, uh, you know, kind of the leaders, pioneers of a Kubernetes specific uh, hardware, uh, extends Kubernetes reach to public cloud. Interested to see where if that's a major departure for them. And then um, Red Hat made an announcement. They've integrated a Kubevert with Kubernetes management platform from SAP. And then uh, Maya Data donates chaos engineering tool to Kubernetes apps for Kubernetes apps to CNCF. So it looks like CNCF picked up two new projects that they're managing now. And the, the whole chaos engineering space is, is pretty hot. Um, over on Security Boulevard, we have, uh, you know, you probably heard this. Uh, India is part of this tit-for-tat thing with China has now banned TikTok. So we've got a tit-for-tat TikTok ban, as well as 59 other Chinese apps that are being blocked in India. And keep in mind, there's a lot of people who work on TikTok in India, as well as a lot of people who are using TikTok to for their businesses in India, and it's kind of left them orphaned. But um, there's that. Device security, don't count on users for that. Yeah, it's an old story right there. And then what's new in cybersecurity legislation doesn't include, or what the new cybersecurity legislation doesn't include. Uh, you know, the uh, cybersecurity legislation is a bit of an oxymoron in and of itself, but check out the article for the details. And then a uh, pandemic shows the need for digital enterprise strategy. Yeah, but when you're in the middle of the storm it's hard it's hard to see where this you know what you're going to do for the next storm um but check out the article there's some good learning in there that's it for the news today next up as i mentioned at the top of the show you know after textron connie took a few weeks off to regroup and he actually had several different virtual events he was resenting at but we're really great grateful to have uh, my digital anarchist co-founder john Wild willis back on Tech Strong TV, and he's here this week with part two of his interview with Dr. Steven Spear of MIT. Dr. Spear is just a brilliant guy, and always good stuff. So let's now go to John Willis and Dr. Steven Spear of MIT on Tech Strong TV. This is Digital Anarchist. To generate knowledge, that doesn't apply to you know piece part production. That that applies everywhere. Yeah. And, and as you were saying about IT, let's link it back. Is that you know plan do plan do plan do? But how about the checking? You know where's the learning in that whole right, set exactly. of experiences? Right. Boom. Well, so you know, I remember I, I went back and I you know I've loved all your docs. Right. And I'll, anybody DevOps Enterprise Summit, uh, Dr. Steven Spear, they're, they're just incredible. I think I don't know if you started in 17 or when your first one was when you did the whole Toyota thing. I don't know we have enough time. Right. Right. The, the decimation story of you know the Prius versus the Volt. Right. But, right. Right. But but I remember in 18, the, the Red Sox are in the World Series. You're being rushed by Gene. And then you have right, to go right. over your other hero, uh, Rick over Admiral Eric over. So I'll give you a few right. minutes to tell me why is he why he's your hero. Oh, all right. So Rick Over is a fascinating guy. So uh, for those of you who don't know, his uh, nicknames were uh, the Admiral. I mean, he was one of, by the time he retired, one of seven or eight four-star admirals in the Navy. But he was the Admiral because he had um, been in the service 60 years. He had been owner for all practical purposes of the Naval Reactor Program, the, you know, the atomic power plant. He had run that since 1948 until his retirement in 1982. And so when people talk about Rick Over, it's the Admiral. And the other name for him is a father of the nuclear Navy. Now, the reason he's a source of great inspiration to my thinking, and I hope to a certain extent to my doing, is that that program has been astounding. You know, the U.S. beat the Soviets to B-52 
beat them to market, as it were, with atomic power onboard warships. But more to the point, since the introduction of atomic power, the, the Soviet record has been horrible, and the Russian record also, in terms of uh, ships lost, crews lost, the environmental damage due to reactor failure. And in contrast, the U.S. performance on the hundreds and hundreds of ships, uh, you know, submarines and aircraft carrier that have had nuclear power, it's been perfect. There's been no incident where a reactor has failed bad enough to hurt a human being, nor has there been uh, any incidents of a reactor failing enough to do environmental damage. Now, where does this come from? Is that Rick Over ran his program in such a way that the, the daily output of it wasn't reactors. The daily output was better understanding. And early in that program, when the science didn't exist, the technology didn't exist, the materials, the processes, the training, et cetera, et cetera. Everything had to be invented. Rick Over established early on what he called the discipline of engineering. And what he meant by the discipline of engineering, I think, was an extreme commitment to the scientific method, that every activity had to be prefaced by a prediction and an explanation of the prediction. And in the course of the activity, it had to be monitored not for compliance, command control, all that nonsense. It had to be monitored to see where reality was contradicting the predictions. So you said, oh, crap, John, this is something I don't get. So that was in the start of the program. And, and the thing that was really remarkable at Rickover is that he treated, all right, so we tend to think about, you know, and if this is a performance or capability and this is time, we tend to think about programs sort of at the initiation that, oh, we're worried about learning and discovery because we're just starting something better than that. We get up and then we get to a plateau where we're capable enough. And it's when we get to this plateau, again, think about this, you know, flattening out curve, that we're in the plateau stage, we tend to think of ourselves as, oh, at this point, we don't have to worry about discovery anymore. We have to worry about operations. And um, operational tempo becomes the dominant concern. And, and if you think about when we're here, you're just starting early on. Our conversation, hey, John, what are you working on? Oh, what'd you learn from that? Oh, John, what are you working on? What'd you discover? Oh, John, what'd you invent? And when we get to this part, it's no longer that conversation. Hey, John, uh, what you working on? Oh, how many did you make today? Yeah. Oh, John, what are you working on? How many did you produce? How many did you ship, right? And we get to this inflection point where the conversation changes. And I think what's really remarkable about Rick Over is that even when the curve changed shape, he never let the conversation change content. And, you know, I talk about in my book, I think it's the fifth chapter or whatnot, and there's a huge amount of evidence. And I've had a chance to get to know over the, the last number of years, people in the submarine service, junior officers enlisted all the way up through very, very senior flag officers. And all of them talk about how that program today, six and seven successors after Rickover, the culture still is, hey, what'd you learn from that? Not how many uh, cycles did you get? And anyway, his attitude established, you know, early on in the 40s, continued through the 80s, and now, you know, still apparently evident is that the reason to manage is to get into people's heads and unlock their ability to learn and discover something useful that can be applied. And whether it's very early stage or uh, what appears to the rest of us a steady state, that's still your job as a leader is to let that happen. Yeah, I think that's, you know, again, I, I was using Delta really as sort of a, a poster for our airlines, right? Not to sort of specifically call out Delta. Right, right. But, uh, you know, I, I think that it goes back to sort of my passion has always been, you know, I, I, I don't read a lot, but I read a, a lot of different things. You know, when I think about sort of Deming, I think about, you know, Mike Rother's book, your book, as these were almost super patents. Even so, you talk about Simon Sinek, start with why. You, right. You, um, David Marquette, the intent base, turn the ship around. The Alcoa story, the the Rickover story. They, there's this there's this blob of beautiful knowledge that seems to be a super patent. And you know, and and I think the more we can have conversations. Where, you know, people, because people get sort of dogmatic about there, they read this book and now I'm going, that's, right. that's my tribe. And you know, again, I, I love, I love the, uh, Sydney, but, but Dr. Dr. Uh, Cook is just a beautiful man, right? And it just frustrates me sometimes when we have these dialogues where he tends to get tribal. 
And I'm like, right. no, I mean, like, didn't we learn anything from that, that experiment we did? Anyway, I guess um, in the end, I, I think High Velocity Edge is an amazing book to me. Thank you. In that super pattern, you know, uh, primordial soup or whatever right. you call it. Right. Well, John, you, know, you think about it, we should hope those super patterns exist, right? So th- think about the natural sciences. You, you, you put some materials together, like in chemistry, and they react a certain way. And, and at first, if people don't understand those materials and their reaction, there's going to be a variety of explanation. Uh, I think it happens this way. I think it happens. Mm-hmm. We're seeing this with COVID-19 now, right? Which right. is, um, it transmits this way, it transmits that way, da 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 But the thing is, it transmits a way. And eventually, the community will compare notes and say, well, why did you reach the conclusion about how it transmits or how you treat it? And why did you reach that conclusion about how it transmits and how it's treated and that kind of thing? And the notes will be compared and someone will say, oh, we have a shared insight. Holy cow. You know, and maybe the reason we disagreed at first, we just didn't understand. Maybe we disagreed at first because we were looking at it in different contexts. But now we have a much better understanding of the disease. And thank goodness for that, because we can um, – manage its transmission and we can manage its treatment from a common set of frameworks and perspectives. All right. So we we certainly not only hope, well, one, we expect that to occur and uh, we we hope that it happens quickly, but I I don't think there's anyone who's going to say, Oh, you know, the folks at John Hopkins and the folks at Stanford and UCSF, et cetera, they're going to have divergent and increasingly divergent explanations of COVID-19. We expect that there may be an initial divergence, but that is going to converge together. We expect that. All right. And it is because they're trying to explain the same thing. Right. Now let's think about, you know, Lean Six Sigma, Agile, um, re-engineering, whatever else these things are. There's a commonality to what they're trying to explain, right? Which is the ability of certain organizations employing some large number of people using some fairly sophisticated technology. They're trying to explain how some organizations can do that, you know, manage lots of people with uh, lots of technology, how they do that and get to much better solutions quicker, faster, easier than anybody else. And yes, it, at first you would expect some divergence of explanation, but you'd actually be really happy if you found these super patterns and found this convergence that like the folks at Toyota operating, you know, outside of Nagoya in the 40s and 50s, they came to an answer about how to do this well. And Edwards Deming apparently was, I don't think he had contact with Toyota, but he was looking at the same issue, which is how do you get harmonization in collective effort? And he came up with an answer. And his answer also is about creating a learning dynamic. And Admiral Rickover, who I don't think had any contact with Deming, nor did he have contact with Toyota, certainly, he's trying to figure out how you harness the efforts of of what grew to tens of thousands of people in this uh, defense supply network. How do you harness the efforts of tens of thousands of people so you get to really good answers very quickly, very effectively, very efficiently? And he he came up with an answer. And, And I think we should take one comfort and joy even that there actually is a super pattern. And in fact, this idea that there are these tribes and they say, oh, my pattern is different than your pattern. It can't be. It, it, it just, it, it's, it's crap science. If they say, oh, no, no, I, 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 I'm studying this phenomenon, but I have one pattern. Someone else says, I'm studying the same phenomenon. I have a different pattern. So I don't know. There's got to be one super pattern. And, and, and if you're pat, right? Yeah. So anyway, sorry for the rant. No, no. I, you know, the, the, <laughs> well, we could rant for because, I mean, I think part of the, the tribal nature of these, you know, I asked you one time, like I was asking you once about like even in academia. There seems to be these like different elevators, <laughs> you know, right. like, we, even within in a learning institution, there's the, the, the guy who studies this set of science, this science, and, and they don't actually ever have lunch together or talk. But, and I think that slows yeah. us down, right? That just slows our industry right. down. I don't know. Well, think- look, in the, nat- in the natural sciences, there are forces of opportunism, ego, commercialization, which tend to uh, pull communities apart. The advantage the natural sciences have is to have credibility, unity. You have to have results which replicate. And the, the results that replicate, they replicate only if the universe <laughs> lets you replicate them. 
And the universe as a judge and as a jury and as having a veto on your ideas, the universe wins every time. And so, right. And so in the natural sciences where the universe is the ultimate force of honesty, uh, the universe is going to force the convergence down to a few harmonious, super pattern, parsimonious ideas. Look, I mean, Einstein needed three letters and a number, right? And uh, equal MC squared. And Newton needed three letters, F equal MA, right? And, and the reason for that is the universe told them, that's all you get. That's right. But, but when you get to the social sciences, the problem is there's less ability maybe, but there's less forcing to look for the replicable result. And it creates the, it creates the opportunity for people to start competing, not on the, uh, the quality of the answer, but the elegance of the semantics. And once you get semantics, then you have the opportunity for tribes because every tribe has its own. It has its own lexicon. You know, and, and just, just thinking, you know, agile, what is agile? I mean, I, I think fundamentally it's, it's a, a race to get uh, quick feedback on small experiments rather than getting slow feedback on very difficult multivariable experiments. It's a scientific method. What's Toyota's approach was standard work with tests built in when you, to tell you that the work's good. It's a scientific method. I mean, uh, Deming, you know, control charts. What's a control chart? A control chart is a prediction. We have a process. I think, I predict, John, the process will have this meet. I predict, I think, John, that it'll have this variance. And I'm going to run the process now. And if it tells me I'm wrong about mean and variance, I'm going to stop and say, whoa, you know, <laughs> we have to build some better understanding of this process because the process, the universe told us we were wrong. And, yeah. Anyway. No, I love but, that. Uh, you know, that you, yeah. if, if you, and you don't get to watch this, it's like a two and a half hour video. So if you're really geek early on, you make that observation about, you know, the, the old joke about, you know, you'll, you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans, you know, and, and right, right, right. you know, the, that simplicity too. I, I had to think about Elliot Gorat has this beyond the goal, right? Which uh-huh. It's an audio only. And he says, he says, um, you know how you win the, and he has this sort of snickering uh, Israeli accent, which he, and he laughs at his own jokes. It's like hilarious just to listen to him. And he says, you want to know how to win the, uh, the Nobel prize in physics. It's real simple. You write basically one page and, and you'll know you've won when every other physicist in the world goes, Oh shit. <laughs> it was that simple, <laughs> you know? Um, right. So, uh, yeah. That, that, that sort of simplicity um, is, I think that's a, a big part of what Gene talks about in the Unicorn Project. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned Gene, and I just want to give credit to him, to you, to your you know, your, your group of colleagues, is uh, we talked about tribes. And, and part of the reason I think tribes um, get created is someone has an idea and they get positive feedback on the idea. And because they get positive feedback on the idea, their thinking switches from it's about the idea to it's about me. And uh, you know, I want to be the guru of the idea, but I, I want it about me. And uh, so if you want it about you, then, you know, creating your own lexicon and semantics to describe the same thing I'm describing is a, a very useful thing because it distinguishes you from me. And, and there are people who like your lexicon versus mine. And so they swarm to you and other people, you know, hopefully like my lexicon and they swarm to me. And the compliment, I, and I, I've said this to a lot of people, especially recently, I think the real credit to what you and Gene are doing and your colleagues are doing, you've always made it about the ideas. Uh, you've never made it about yourselves. And because you've removed your own egotistical needs from the forum, you know, pun intended there, but you move removed yourselves as the center and put the ideas at the center stage of the forum. It's allowed other people to come in and put in and take out without worry about whether or not it's that they run the risk of being demeaned by one tribe or another. Anyway, uh, no, the, I wish that I wish that was more universal. No, the, the, one of the things I've loved about DevOps, there was this. I, I wrote an article way back on about the convergence of DevOps, right? Which was you had uh, you know Eric Reese trying to turn lean thinking. Into and then you had open source, which was happening, and then you had this final sort of young group of young people. I was at the first right. DevOps day ever, right in in Ghent, and it was these, it was just a bunch. I was twenty years old, and everybody there, and it was just these young kids throwing their hands up, saying, 
what we've been doing has not been working. Right. And, and that sort of evolved. And then Gene got involved. And then, you know, the Phoenix Project became a lighthouse. But it's always been egoless. I mean, you've been to the what, what's phenomenal to me is those events are right. banks talking to banks. It's it's, you know, people. It's all about the sharing and the, the helping and the mentoring. And and I think it right. all evolved because there was a point in time where open source, where lean was being explained in, you know, the, the lean startup model. All that was happening around the same right. time, and and yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. And it, 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 yeah I'm, I'm glad you make reference to the lean startup because if you go through that book, what it, what is Eric basically saying? He said, you know, you're, you're starting something up, so assume you don't have an answer. That's right. why you're starting up. If you had an answer, you wouldn't be starting up, right? And then he says, and how do you go about getting to a better answer? So he takes some of the terms from Lean. He says, you know, go study this thing. You don't understand. Well, that's good science, right? You know, if you don't understand something, create an experiment. And then even further, he says, and don't think too much. Because what's the point of thinking if you don't understand anyway? So rather than thinking too much, go run experiments. And actually try to run the experiments in a way which is um, a very, fairly close approximation of the as close an approximation of the reality you're trying to simulate. And then when the experiment fails, and he has terrific stories like, oh, we're trying to create this app, we're trying to create that app, and we have these avatars, and what do the avatars talk to each other? We had all these expectations, but we handed it to the teenage girls that we wanted to use the app, and they said it sucks. That's right, yeah. yeah. And it's like, that was good to know, you know, because we, we didn't invest more time in, in that thing. We, we actually took the input and said, well, you know, these girls are part of the universe, and the universe just told us we were wrong. They, you, you take what Eric says about you know you having to get close to the reality you're trying to understand, construct an experiment, and then really, really be respectful when the experiment tells you you're you're wrong. Well, agile does the same thing, right? Which is uh, you know don't try and plan out this whole thing and think that you're going to get it right. Set an early milestone. And try to generate something, you know, minimally viable product. Right. And, and why do you call it a minimally viable product? Because if we're not minimal, either it wouldn't be a product or it would be too much. But go, go for the least you need, that it's viable, that you can hand it to someone and say, hey, what do you think? Here's what I think you and, and again, you do that with real discipline, like Eric's describing. You hand that minimally viable product to someone, and, and in the back, you have to say, hey, I'm handing this to John, you know, and here's my expectation how he's going to react to it. And then when he reacts differently, i got to listen. And that's why we have a stand up and a scrum and a sprint. You know, what, why do we sprint? Because I want to get the feedback. I want to find out I'm wrong, but I want, if I want to be wrong, I want to find out sooner than later. But a sprint the, to the minimally viable product. And why do we have a scrum? When I find out I'm wrong, I want to get all our heads together and say, hey, guys, you know, we're all wrong on this. Say, what did we learn from being wrong? A anyway, back to your point about super patterns. We have these, you know, wickedly, wickedly complex um, systems with people using machines. And uh, they keep changing, they're dynamic, the environment's dynamic internally and externally. And uh, for sure, we're going to be wrong about a lot of things all the time. Can I squeeze one more in? I, because I just realized this is one of the most profound things I've ever learned from you. <laughs> good. That's a good way to sort of ask for a couple more minutes, right? In that, in that, for, in that forum, you said something. So, you know, we talked about experimentation, like you learn quickly, learn, you know, Assume you don't know what you're do, you know, doing, so that's how you get right. to PDCA, all those things, the speed. But I think there's that other element that made Toyota really interesting, which is – and you said it like it just – at one point you were just explaining. You said you know, if you talk to the Obi-Wan Kenobis, you, you explain right. like why the poll system really exists. You right. remember that? Yeah, I think that was just – I don't – I've yeah. never heard anybody explain Toyota in that way. Yeah, so just – just to level folks up here, um, sorry, I didn't bring my paper and crayons. So the way a push system exists, just looking for props here. So so push system, a way a push system exists is I have an idea. And I take the idea and I filter it down to uh, the shop floor. And on the shop floor, they've got to adhere to the schedule I have. Now, the advantage of a push system is that um, you can calculate it to great precision. The problem with it is it's terribly fragile because, you know, I have a thought which is uh, already wrong, right? Because uh, my understanding of conditions is imprecise. And then the conditions are dynamic, so they start acting up, and then my schedule goes out, out the window. The way a pull system works is, uh, let's use my glasses as a prop here. You have 
nodes. Let's say this is the customer node and this is the supplier node. The way a pull system works is that the customer asks for stuff. And the supplier says, oh, you asked me for something. Well, let me make it and, and, and return it to you. So it's a, a set of couplings of um, requests triggering action, which uh, leads to a, a response. And there's more to it in terms of how you manage with uh, cycle time. But anyway, that's the basic issue. A request triggers a response. Now, you can just you know line these things up so you have a request response and then this creates a need responding creates a need and there's another request another response and that it up so the explanation out of toyota as to why they do this has again both the ethical the moral the empathetic rationale coupled with the the more rational rationale so they'll tell you look you know the problem with this push system is that I send an instruction down here and I send another instruction down here. And these two things, because they have some variance built in, they quickly prove the fragility of the instructions I was sending. I said, but, but if I have a pull system, then the rate at which this thing is actually occurring will have this dynamic, homeostatic, self-regulating effect on the rate at which this thing is occurring. You know, if this thing goes faster and faster with its request, this thing has to go faster and faster with their responses. Things, if this slows down, then this thing will slow down. You know, it's just how the human body works, right? Which is if I jam, you know, three donuts in a coffee, you know, hopefully my, my camp pancreas is going to be kicking out a lot of insulin to deal with that fact. And if, you know, on the other hand, I'm uh, skip the meal and I'm in like a micro starvation, then uh, my body will adapt to that also. And I can go through the day with these uh, spikes and valleys pretty good because of the self-regulating thing. So they'll say, look, you know, this is inherently a self-regulating system and the push system is not. But then in the same breath, they'll say, why do we want a pull system? Really? Why do we want it? Because I love this. So I would say, well, I'd say, you know, the self-regulating, you know, I, I learned control theory. It's like beautiful ah, because our supply chain extends back thousands of steps. And um, way back here, you know, ooh, way back here is somebody who's uh, making nuts and bolts and tiny little pieces and putting um, tires on rims to create wheels and that kind of thing. And in a push system, all that person knows is that he or she is making a nut and a bolt each day. And when they go home and someone says, oh, what's your job? They say, well, you know, I, just, I make nuts and bolts. But in a pull system, someone who takes a car took it for someone who did step minus uh, step n minus one. And what did that person think? Said, oh, I did the work that made it possible for this person to ship the car. And the next person did n minus two. What they do? Now, I did the work that got rewarded as the car got pulled and I have to make a replacement for it or one in anticipation. When we go all the way back to that person who's step n minus a thousand, who's making nuts and bolts. What did you do today? man, I made nuts and bolts for some car that's in really high demands. I was busy all day making nuts and bolts because people wanted to buy those nuts and bolts as part of the car they got. Anyway. You also talked yeah. about that, that. I mean, that, that also that sort of culture aspect too, right? Like that somebody was going to basically pay this is pre America, right? Like somebody, your, your brother, your sister, your neighbor is going to pay two thirds of their yearly salary for something you're going to make. And so that person all the way back N minus thousand, like knew they were responsible for that. I thought yeah. that was an interesting. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I once had a conversation at a consultancy where all the employees were former, not only military, but like special ops, you know, no one did anything usual. They, you know, no one flew a helicopter. They flew only helicopters and special ops at night in the rain, right. Mm -hmm. um, under heavy fire. And so I was talking about Toyota and I said, well, how can you possibly get inspired by putting a wheel on a car? You know, it's basically place the, the rim and tighten a couple of bolts, four bolts. And he said, how could that be exciting? I said, well, is that really the job? Right. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, why are you putting the wheel on the car? He says, because the car needs a wheel, but why does it need a wheel? Someone's got to drive them. Without the wheel, you can't drive the car. I said, all right, well, there's a little bit of a quality thing there. I said, what if you put the wheel on poorly? What happens? I said, well, the wheel might wobble. I said, worse than that. Yeah, the wheel might fall off. I said, so the guy putting the wheel on the car, 
What are they really doing? They're providing safety to somebody who's going to trust that car to carry their children. Oh, okay. Anyway, Toyota, you know, makes a big emphasis on the pull system and a lot of other things to give people the sense of a reality. It's a, they're not making it up. This is not fantasy, right? They're trying to give them a sense of the reality that what they're doing is important to somebody else. And uh, if they do it right, it'll be appreciated. And if they do it wrong, that might have a consequence. Yeah, is it, John, it's just thinking out loud and then I'll stop monologuing. Yeah, no worries. There's a, there's a story, and I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a truthiness to it, you know, about President Kennedy going to visit NASA and he's meeting all these uh, hotshot engineers and scientists. And there's a guy with a broom and the president says, what do you do here? And the guy says, Mr. President, I'm going to put a man on the moon. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, if that story is true or it's somewhat true, it's because someone had uh, phrased all the work there Inspired. as putting a man on the moon. Right. And, and, and whether you were doing a calculation for orbital reentry, like on that movie, uh, Missing Figures, or you're, you know, making an environment right. in which people could do those calculations, you're putting a man on the moon. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I love the the contrast, you know, the circle it all the way back to command and chaos or command and control, all um, right. which is the, the two quotes. And I, I don't know if I've got them exactly right, but, you know, Sloan said, we, we're we not in the, the the business of car making cars, we're in the business of making money. And Toyota Ono said, we're not in the business of making great cars, we're in the business of making great people who make cars. Right, right. It just tells you everything you need to know about. Boom. So the two yeah. Businesses. I love this. So where do people find you? You've got, I know, I know it's just uh, for people to listen, uh, there have been a lot of the big organizations in the DevOps who have brought Dr. Spears in, Pierre in to help. And I know you have a consulting business and I've heard sort of great things about people I know who've worked with you. So where oh, do people you. find you? Yes. Yeah, so the quickest is just send me an email, right? <laughs> Which is Steve, you know, my first name, no end, Steve at H-V-E L-L-C.com. Same website, www.hvellc.com, or we've created a series of tools to uh, support this rapidity of being able to see problems so they can be addressed and solved. And the, the website for that is, again, www.cseec2solve.com. We kept it simple. So excellent. Um, visit us at either of those places and I'd love to have the conversation. And Bob's your uncle, right? And then uh, let's see what happens to the Yankees and Red Sox and whatever they decide well, the, the to do. The Red Sox, so the Red Sox are still in first place, and they'll be in first That's place right. until the normal yeah. All Star break. <laughs> You're gonna hold on to that one. All right, my friend. This was I. I had a blast. Thank you so much, so. John. Thanks very much, my man. All right. Okay, next up, and you know, we usually have Charlene O'Hanlon, managing editor, in this slot, but uh, our own Mike Vizard had a great conversation with the TIPCO CTO, Nelson Petracek, and uh, I, you know, we we wanted to move it up in the show. We we do have a channel roundup later on, but for now, I want I wanted to have you guys check out this great interview Mike had with the uh, CTO of TIPCO, Nelson Petracek, Mike, and here it is. This is Digital Anarchist. All right, thanks, guys. We're here with Nelson Petracek, who is the CTO for TIPCO. Nelson, welcome to the show. Great. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. So every time I turn around, there's, uh, I don't know, APIs, microservices, DevSecOps, lions and bears and tigers, oh my. Yeah. What's going on? And walk us through how all this might come together in some cohesive fashion. Well, the, the animals, uh, we're not quite sure how they might come together, but definitely the other aspects uh, have and, and are at least being thought of in the same sentences. Uh, as, as you mentioned, very buzzword compliant these days when it comes to uh, technology. Um, you know, really, most organizations, though, I think, are starting to really embrace the notion of APIs. Uh, how they can use APIs to access their data, expose their functions, uh, and potentially to monetize those APIs in different ways. So 
Uh, and microservices is a whole other story. That's probably something separate, but definitely related. People will use microservice-based approaches to build the underlying logic underneath APIs. But, uh, but yeah, APIs are a hot topic these days. Uh, you, you can't throw a lion or a tiger or a bear or whatever else very far without hitting somebody that's talking about them. Do you think the security people appreciate what's going on with APIs? And developers, of course, are building these things, but um, who supports them? Who secures them? And are there a set of best practices here we should be thinking about specifically for securing APIs? Sure. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely the two, two parts to this. One is the technical side of how you're going to secure your APIs. Uh, whether you're using you know, TLS, whether you're doing OAuth or JWT or you know, all these different things that you can associate with APIs and API endpoints. Uh, but there's also almost a, an organizational aspect of this as well. And so in some ways, depending on how you do it, it can actually be a good thing. Um, the developers in some ways may only get access to the information or APIs that they should have access to because a separate team has set up security around different APIs, if you will. So if you're into just assembling you know, different APIs to build an application, you can control that. So in some ways, it can actually simplify the security model because you're not giving every developer every type of access to every system, to every database, and you know, maybe you quickly can lose control on that type of scenario. So if you can do so through the API layer, in some ways that can simplify things. Who's in charge of that? Is it the DevOps team or is it a security guy or somebody else all together? Yeah, it's uh, usually a combination. Obviously the security folks uh, don't like to be left out. So they are definitely part of that conversation. The, uh, the developer, as well as the different project teams, uh, you know, that'll, a lot of this will depend on how you've organized your API program internally. But there, there will be an architect um, that is in charge of one aspect of the APIs being security, so he'll be in charge of that part of it. Uh, and then developers will typically work under that guidance, hopefully. So that's the, uh, that's the goal. But it's really a, it's a combined effort. You gotta take the, uh, with the security information guy, what he's working on, uh, mash that up with what the API program is meant to address, uh, and then look to see you know, are your APIs being consumed internally, externally, and so on, work with the right folks to get that to happen. Okay, so the developers are the lions and the ops guys are the tigers and the security guys are the bears. Is this how this works out? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I, I'll, I'll go with that. I've been called much worse. So if you're going to equate it to animals, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, I think that works out well. <laughs> um, what am I actually using to secure all this stuff? I mean, when I talk to people, there's soft to tokens, hard tokens, and all this other stuff out there. It seems it's hard to sort out what to use when. Sure. Yeah. And it, it's, it's going to be varying degrees of, of how people are going to do this. Of course, in some simplest form, it could just be you know, username, password related. Uh, other cases, you're going to use things like OAuth, uh, OpenID, right? Depending on whether you're looking at the whole Auth and Auth Z world. Um, you know, uh, you're going to be looking at potentially some API management platforms, which will tie into those types of environments. And that's what I see a lot of organizations moving towards is some sort of gateway, some sort of management platform, uh, even what they now refer to as a, as a micro gateway, if you will, um, just securing those API endpoints at different layers throughout the organization. Are there going to be constraints around where people are located? I mean, is there a physical aspect to API security or is it all completely digital? No, I mean, definitely when people are, are concerned about you know, where the information is going, privacy laws, GDPR, uh, the whole notion of data uh, location, uh, it, it has some relevance for sure. I mean, depending on what type of information you're exposing, you're going to want to tightly control how people can access and pull that information just to make sure that in some cases it's staying within the confines of where that information is supposed to live. So. Uh, whether it's bounded by a country or some other sort of parameter or perimeter, uh, it, it can actually be a key element of what you're doing in terms of who can access what and you know where, where and how you're going to give them the ability to pull uh, your data. It's not clear to me that people have been factoring security into their thought process when they pick an API management platform. Is that getting better or is that becoming a, a you know, is that moving further up the conscious thought process? I, I think it is. I, I think there's been enough incidents in the past that uh, show you what happens when you are not conscious of such things. Uh, personal information can quickly get out there. I went one. Uh, I saw my one of my favorite tweets that I saw, and I, I forget who um, posted it, but 
the, uh, the response was, well, why do you need my name and address again? Can't you just check the dark web? And it, it's, a, uh, it's a great little line um, because it, it really is a key consideration. A lot of people are really concerned now around where their information sits, uh, who's giving you access or giving access to that information, where it's going. Uh, so I, I find that it's, it's a, a part of the process or discussion that's a lot more upfront nowadays as opposed to being an afterthought, something at the end that you dealt with once you had a security breach. What's your best advice to people and what are the most common mistakes you see? Hmm. Uh, so, I mean, going off of the previous question, think about it early. So think about even implementing security and security constructs even before you build the underlying logic under the APIs. So I always say start with the API contract, mock that contract, so deploy a service that looks like the real service, and then secure it. You're putting a lot less at risk at that phase in the overall API development lifecycle than if you waited until the very end when you tried to roll security into the process. So think about it early uh, and also incorporate the proper monitoring into your APIs. Uh, monitoring in this sense, because it may not just be as something as simple as a, as a breach, if you will, if you will, you know, a, a simple username password breach if that's all you're using, which is not recommended, but it can also lead to even being able to understand patterns of access. You may even want to use AIML at the API layer to monitor the traffic and how it's being used. And if you see something that deviates beyond what's you know, the normal pattern of access, then that could actually be an indication of some sort of attack against your API. So it's not just, again, the JWT uh, aspect of it, OAuth, OpenID, SSL, or TLS, those kinds of things. It's also about making sure you've got the right hooks, monitor and measure as early and as upfront as you can. And then you can even use techniques like AI ML to see you know, if you do have a potential issue. Speaking of that, how automated can all this get become? Because when I think about it, um, a lot of the issues are fairly rote. They come up with time and time again. So can I just find some way to set a policy that says, when there's this deviation, go back to what I said it was supposed to be in the first place? <laughs> I, th I think some of it, yes. I think some of it you can automate. A lot of it is going to be dependent on characteristics of your API, whether they're external facing, internal facing, whether they're used as almost like a feature or an upsell onto an existing product set, whether it's for interaction between you and a partner, uh, if it's for operational efficiency within the organization's boundaries, if you will. So how you monitor, what you're monitoring, the information you want to collect and how you analyze it will be somewhat dependent, of course, on the use cases themselves. But you can automate some of that. You can take that logic based upon historical data, uh, generate your models from that, automatically inject it into the process through a CI/CD pipeline of sorts. So you, you can automate it. Uh, it's just, it won't all be automagic, right? It's, it's not gonna just magically know what is normal for you and what is normal in that context. So, but once you have some boundaries and guidelines around that, you can automate how you deploy it, where it's deployed, whether it's kind of autom automatically baked into your deployment target, if you will. All right. I'm deeply chagrined that there will be no magic act to go with my lions and bears and tigers, but <laughs> we'll figure it out. There might hey. be somewhere along the lines for sure. Hey, Nelson, thanks for being on the show. Oh, appreciate it. Great. Good chatting with you. All right, guys, back to you in the studio. Disruption is occurring across every aspect of IT. Open source, cloud services, DevOps, and cloud native software architectures are democratizing IT and radically transforming how business is done. The old ways of creating software and doing IT are being replaced with agile, flexible, faster, and cheaper methods, benefiting vendors and users alike. Accelerated Strategies Group is out to democratize access of industry expertise and knowledge. We use our expertise and experience to offer insightful, intelligent, useful information in a variety of formats relevant to the IT community, digital events, videos, reports, assessments, workshops, and implementation projects with tech vendors, IT organizations, and business leaders. We widely and openly share our work products, often for free. Analyst reports these days aren't worth more than a graph or chart that tells a story or illustrates a market trend. 
We work with developers, DevOps teams, cloud architects, security engineers, and transformation leaders most every day, creating and implementing transformational strategies and technologies. We're not just thinkers, we're also doers. Hey everybody, welcome back to TechStrong TV. I am Charlene O'Hanlon, Managing Editor at Media Ops, and uh, we are just uh, ahead of a long holiday weekend. But before we get started on our celebrating, I wanted to let you guys know about some of the webinars we have coming up next week on DevOps.com. The first one is happening Tuesday, July 7th at 1 p.m., and it's called Autonomous Incident and Root Cause Detection. Um, Actually, that's the name of the webinar and that's exactly what it's about. Um, but going a, just a little bit deeper, the speakers for this event are really gonna talk about how machine learning can help, uh, can be used to help automate problem detection and root cause characterization. Um, it's a technical one, so definitely worth checking out if uh, you're having issues in that area. Uh, again, that one is Tuesday at 1 p.m. on devops.com, 1 p.m. Eastern. Our second webinar is happening on the uh, same day, Tuesday, July 7th, also on DevOps.com. And this one is happening at 3 p.m. Eastern. The, uh, the webinar is called Kubernetes, Reducing Infrastructure Cost and Complexity. And it takes a look at some of the challenges that organizations are facing um, in keeping their Kubernetes uh, workloads highly available while keeping their costs low. So they're gonna be looking at how to leverage cloud-native auto-scaling, uh, pod requirement, right-sizing, resource buffer allocation, or sorry, resource buffer definition, cost allocation, and a lot more. So definitely worth checking out if your organization is looking into using Kubernetes or is already using Kubernetes and having issues. Um, definitely worth uh, checking out this webinar. This one is actually sponsored by Spot. Again, that one is happening Tuesday, July 7th at 3 p.m. Eastern on DevOps.com. Well, the third and final webinar for this uh, particular session is uh, being held Wednesday, July 8th at 1 p.m. And it's called Revolutionize Software Test Automation with AI. And this one is actually being presented by uh, Aaron, Aaron Bekar, who was actually one of my panelists on my recent ML Ops panel discussion. Uh, where we talked about how uh, machine learning and AI ops uh, are kind of transforming the landscape and uh, particularly the DevOps tool chain. So, uh, but this one, in this one, he's going to be talking about how his company Microfocus has actually uh, integrated machine learning into uh, their test automation uh, technologies. And um, really, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at helping organizations speed, uh, in, introduce more speed and reliability into their continuous delivery pipeline. So definitely, uh, if you're looking into ways to uh, make your pipeline faster, more reliable, uh, and uh, without having to uh, do a ton of legwork, um, then definitely this is one worth checking out. As always, you can go look at the listing of webinars on devops.com. Just go to devops.com uh, slash webinars, look in the upcoming section, and there will be a list of all of the webinars. And uh, you could do the same on Security Boulevard as well, and a container journal as well. But until then, I will uh, enjoy my weekend, and I hope you enjoy your long weekend. Have a great day, everybody. We have a new uh, series starting up here on Tech Strong TV, or a new segment, regular segment. It features my good friend Jane Grow, my partner at the DevOps Institute, the Humans of DevOps Association, and it's called Jane Explains. And Jane's going to give you every week or every other week. She's going to pick a great topic to explain in case you're, you know, you may have heard the topic, you're somewhat familiar with it, you're not sure. Jane's going to dive into it. This is the first one of Jane Explains. I hope you'll enjoy it. She's looking for feedback and more ideas too. So write to her if you can. And, uh, but let's now start with our first Jane Explains. This is Digital Anarchist. Hi everyone, I'm Jane Grohl, CEO of the DevOps Institute, and welcome to my first official segment 
of Chain Explains. As I mentioned before, my intent here is to try to distill some of the things that you may be hearing, all of the concepts, all the vocabulary uh, for those of you that may be familiar or maybe not familiar, but just to present it to you in a digestible form. So I thought I would start this series with what is DevOps? Now, you might have read a lot of different things about what DevOps is. Is it a philosophy? Is it a movement? Is it all culture? Is it all automation? Um, how do we frame DevOps in our organization? So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, and then I'm going to hopefully position DevOps in a way that most of you will be able to relate to. So I had the privilege of, of being at a DevOps days uh, a long time ago in 2012 in California. And, and at that time, there was debate about whether DevOps would actually cross the chasm into the enterprise space, whether it was something that uh, the unicorns would only be able to do because their corporate DNA was younger. And of course, traditional uh, enterprise had to scale. And at that same time, Gene Kim and his colleagues were writing the Phoenix Project. And so when we look at the origins of DevOps, really it's an extension or was meant to be an extension into what had been started with Agile. And, and that was an intent to produce software smaller, faster, and more frequently. And, and at its heart, that is DevOps. It is a set of principles and practices about delivering software faster, smaller, and more frequently. And as Gene and his colleagues were writing the Phoenix Project, the core principles around DevOps emerged in that novel. And that was the three ways. First way to really be able to understand and mitigate flow. So if you understand your constraints and you start to remove those constraints, flow has to increase. So that's the ability to go faster. When you start to look at the second, the second way, which is shortened feedback loops, that was an opportunity to make course corrections along the way, whereas say in waterfall software development, that feedback wasn't solicited until close to the end or the bottom of the waterfall. And some of you may know, climbing back up a waterfall can be a little slippery. So the second way was intended to shorten the feedback loops, partially through using automation, uh, partially, partially by embracing, say, this, the principles and spirit of continuous delivery. But regardless of however it was done, it was meant to uh, make sure that feedback was frequent, was constant. Uh, and again, if we were going smaller, faster, and more frequently, then the ability to shorten those feedback loops would be there. And then finally, the third way was to invest in, in what we now call mindful experimentation and continuous learning, where if we were going to go faster, frequently, and smaller, then we also had to be a continuous learning organization to continuously experiment on how to achieve those three goals um, and the best way to do that would be to understand risk, to take mindful risks, experimentation, and then certainly to be able to learn um, on a continuous basis. So DevOps was really founded on three principles, but there's so much more to it. So I promised you I would put DevOps in the context of something we're all familiar with. And I'm going to uh, use the analogy of a recipe. I like to think of DevOps as a recipe. So if you open a cookbook to any recipe, it is essentially a map or a guideline for how to produce an outcome, hopefully something delicious. Uh, but in and of itself, it has no value. Right? In and of itself, the recipe doesn't mean anything until we actually start to bring that recipe to life. And we also know that the recipe or the outcome of the recipe is going to be wholly dependent on the quality of the ingredients and the skills of the chef. So now let's look at DevOps in that context. DevOps on its own is a set of principles. It's a set of principles for how to go faster, smaller, more frequently, and doing that through the key elements of people, process, and automation. So like any recipe, those key elements, we'll call them ingredients, 
are going to be also dependent on the quality of the agreement of the ingredient and also the proportion of the ingredient. Too much of one, too little of the other, and the recipe doesn't come out the way that you would like it to. So again, DevOps as a recipe, and let's look at it as a recipe for IT. You could call it a recipe for digital transformation, but it is essentially a recipe for a new way of working in IT is wholly dependent on the ingredients, the quality of the ingredients, people, process, and automation, and also the proportion of those ingredients. Too much automation, not enough automation, uh, skilled, your skilled workforce, right? Making sure that your humans are cross-skilled, that they're hybrid humans. And then also, of course, having underpinning uh, process that creates intelligent process, creates intelligent people, and it also creates intelligent automation. And we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about those. So if you're the chef, right? If you're the chef or the team of chefs that are going to cook up this DevOps recipe, then we also know that if you go into any commercial kitchen, any restaurant kitchen, it's not usually a single chef that's preparing all those meals. And each of the chefs have a certain level of skill, but they also have a core competency. So if you think of the kitchen crew in a restaurant as the teams or the skill talent that's necessary to bring DevOps to life, then hopefully you're starting to get a picture of, of what really goes into to DevOps. So let's dive into those ingredients just a little bit as I start to explain this even further. So we know that DevOps is really a set of principles that will guide us to creating an outcome that allows software to be delivered smaller, faster, more frequently. In order to achieve that, we need ingredients, people, process, and automation. So DevOps is not the same as CICD. There's the automation piece, very, very important. It's not the same as, as a cultural movement. It's not entirely a cultural movement. And it's not the same as some of the uh, process frameworks that, that IT has adopted in the past. And you know, IT, we love our frameworks, right? Whether it's Agile or ITIL or SRE or any of the above. It is the combination of all of those, right? It is the elements of each of those having skilled humans who also have great human skills. They're good collaborators, they're good communicators, they're diverse and they respect diversity. They're, they have good empathy, they ask for other people's opinions, right? They are interoperable as humans, but they also have really good critical thinking skills. Those are the high quality people that you want. They may be amazing architects, incredible developers, but we're now coining the term hybrid human. When we look at automation, we need to have interoperable, or they call it the API economy, in order to be able to shift some of the activities that might have been manual to the left, where say security testing now happens very early on, where we start to look at uh, recognition and skills in provisioning infrastructure or release automation or uh, testing, general testing, build automation, right? All of that's really critical and, and in today's environment is often built on multiple tools, some open source, some enterprise in order to create the automation architecture that will help you go faster, more frequently, and smaller. And then from a process perspective, DevOps Institute does an annual upskilling report. And interestingly enough, on the process side, the top processes were not necessarily aligned with a framework, right? The frameworks were used to support the top processes, but the top process were, processes were use of source control models, understanding flow analytics, right? So those are the kinds of processes that not only need to be contained in a single unit or a single team, but do need to be as interoperable and replicated with automation whenever possible, uh, but there has to be a consistency across the entire pipeline. People process automation uh, may sound very high level, but when you start to drill into those ingredients, the same as you would pick you know, different ingredients depending on your recipe, but you would also choose the highest quality recipe, uh, highest quality ingredients as well. 
So again, let's go back to our analogy of DevOps as a recipe for IT. You can call it a recipe for digital transformation, but it is basically new IT. All of those ingredients in our recipe are important, but I can line them up on my kitchen counter. But if I don't understand how to put it all together, right? In what proportion, as I said before, too much of one, too much of the other, and your recipe doesn't come out well. Too much focus on one, too much time with the other, too much uh, cooking time of one. You, you get it, you're, you're going with me on this, right? So really the critical success factor in, in all of this, as far as DevOps go, has to be the humans. You know, DevOps Institute, our mission is to advance the humans of, of DevOps and digital transformation doesn't happen without human transformation. So I could have the greatest recipe, I could have the highest quality ingredients, but if I don't have a team of skilled, hybrid, interoperable, interpersonal, collaborative humans, it's just not going to work. And that's why DevOps is always first considered a cultural movement because all of the other ingredients are highly dependent on the culture or the kitchen in which those ingredients are put together. So I hope you've had a little fun with me going through my analogy of DevOps as a, a recipe. But if you really kind of step back and process that, it makes sense. It makes sense. DevOps is not the same as, as continuous delivery. It's not only a cultural movement. It's not only going to be through a single process framework, regardless of which framework you're particularly enamored with. There is no magic bullet on the, on the, the process landscape. It is all of those ingredients. And so just to wrap up, what is DevOps? DevOps is IT. Right? It started because there was a recognition that our development silos and our operation silos were not working well together. Right? We were not using the same tools. We were not using the same vocabulary. We were not using the same processes. We didn't even know what each other's processes were. We grew up in, in you know, driving cars in parallel lanes when we didn't realize we needed to be in the same car. So DevOps is new IT. I hope you come away from this really thinking about some of the things I said, really looking at your organization, looking at the skill of the people, looking at what automation you have, doing a gap analysis, and then stop worrying about what DevOps is and start doing it, right? Today, it's not about the what. It's not even about the why. I think the pandemic has certainly shown us uh, at, at least a lot of the why. Now you have to get to the how. So in future segments of Jane Explains, again, I'm not the most technical person on the block. I will try to start looking at some of these concepts that will get you to the how. Next time, I want to look at value streams. I think that any organization that's getting started on a DevOps journey should understand what their definition of value is. So I'm not going to tell you how to do a value stream map but I'm gonna help you understand what is value stream mapping, what is value stream management, and why it's important to your organization. Until then, stay safe, stay well, stay curious. I'm Jane Grohl, and this was Jane Explains. Our next episode is our Analyst Corner with Mitch, except there's no Mitch today. Uh, ASG Principal Analyst Sanjeev Sharma is filling in. And Sanjeev has some great commentary I think you're going to enjoy. Let's now go to Sanjeev Sharma, Principal Animal Analyst, ASG. Hello and welcome. My name is Sanjeev Sharma. I'm co-founder and principal analyst at Accelerator Strategies. And welcome to Analyst Corner. Now, if you've been watching uh, Analyst Corner before, you probably have seen my partner in crime, Mitch Ashley, present here. Mitch is our CEO at Accelerator Strategies and my co-founder. Well, Mitch is out today, so I'm stepping in for him. So uh, let me share some of my thoughts uh, as an analyst in the field. Now, I spend a lot of time talking to clients, talking to other vendors, trying to understand and help and advise them on their journey of improving their ability to deliver software, 
their uh, ability to transform, go through their digital transformation. And there are certain observations I've made in the 